Create your own stadium experience wherever you are with the Zones Watch Party. Connect with friends and share the moment. Watch Party on the Zone. Wide receiver, Alabama. Yeah, this is a favorite of a lot of coaches around the league, and I get why. You talk about route running, feel, and instincts. With DAZN and Apple TV, you can watch up to four events at the same time with multi-view. You can watch two, three, or four events at once. Just slide up for the full multi-screen experience and move the highlighted box to change the audio. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome. The fight starts I want to fight. We're in Vegas as the third chapter of an epic boxing story will be written in Sin City. A fight four years in the making will finally take place later tonight at Magnificent T-Mobile Arena. It's old Canelo Alvarez and Gennady Golovkin face off. But before that, we're bringing you four absolutely cracking fights to get you ready for the main card. We're off the strip. We're in the magnificent T-Mobile Arena. The fans are already starting to file in here, expecting something really, really special tonight. And I think they're going to get it. Remember, the main card is only available on the Zone pay-per-view. You see the QR code on the screen. Make sure you scan it, you really don't want to miss something very, very special tonight. As always, joined by the magnificent Ak and Barak. Look, we've had the head to heads, we've had the weigh-ins, we've seen all the promos. Energy is starting to build in as well. What's going to happen tonight? What can we expect? You know, the one thing I think of the most is what a loss did to Canelo after the Floyd fight. We all saw what happened with his career then. It turned a switch on. I mean, he was motivated. He never wanted us to lose again. That was his energy back then. He's coming off a loss against Bavol. What type of Canelo you think we're going to see tonight? Yeah, a, a I'm, I'm scared. Right? Yeah, but there's also another chip, a chip on Triple G's shoulder who thought in 2017 and 2018, I won both fights. You didn't beat me. So I think that same dislike that Canelo has, and he's showing it publicly, Triple G got more hatred for Canelo. 
Yes. I don't know. I think the hatred is equal about now. <laughs> yeah, I think we, What if you if you're the guy that lost, come on. No, I'm talking about the the slander that we got from Triple G and Can you know, Canelo is He's upset. <laughs> he's trying to take it out on him tonight. And he's been predicting a knockout. I wouldn't say predicting a knockout, but he's been saying he wants to stop him. He wants to make a statement. But he did tell us a couple of days ago, Rock, that uh, he's going to let it come. Yeah. He still would be. I asked him, would you be happy if you don't score a knockout? He said, I'll be happy with the win. Okay. And we're going to hear from Canelo. We're going to hear from GGG as well. So much to come before the main card. We've got some really good fights for you on the undercard as well, on the prelims. We start with Superman Anthony Herrera. He takes on Delvin McKinley. Then as they say, somebody's O has got to go as unbeaten duo Aaron Aponte and Fernando Molina go head to head. Mark Castro puts his flawless record on the line when he faces Kevin Montiel Mendoza. And the prelims conclude with Diego Pacheco against Enrico Colazzo. Fantastic fight, that one. WBC United States silver, 168 pound belt up for strap, which is very, very good for a fighter. I think this stage of his career to be fighting for a belt. Look, we've been speaking so much about Canelo. We've been speaking so much about GGG. Let's hear from both fighters, myself and Akin Barak, caught up with the main guys in the main event this evening. Fans. Some of the greatest fighters of all time that you admire had trilogies, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you've accomplished so much in the sport. You already have a Hall of Fame mm -hmm. career. But do you Thank feel you. like you needed that trilogy? Ali had a trilogy. No. Pacquiao had a trilogy. Mm -hmm. It'd be nice to have one. It's it's nice to have one, right? right? But uh, I I think I don't need it right, to, right, to be in the uh, in the books of history. Right. But uh, look. I'm happy to be here and I'm happy to bring this kind of fight to my fans. I've been give the fans really good fight, so <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to be here. So, 100%. Now, going back to that Mexican style, he's also saying he's going to do that Mexican style. He didn't do it the second fight. I love it. <laughs> you think he, you think he's going to do it? I love the idea. Okay. Right. Uh, now, I'm now, ready. You, yeah. You've been talking about knockouts a lot and, and you normally don't you know, project that, that I want to stop this guy. Do you feel like maybe you're putting a little pressure on yourself? Will you feel I like unhappy? pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Would that's, be... that's what I work better. So will you be unhappy if you don't get the knockout? Nah. No, 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 no. I prepare myself for 12 rounds, but uh, if the knockout comes, it's going to be... But you're looking I'm, for it. Yeah, I'm uh, looking forward, yeah. <laughs> you know, usually when you have a trilogy, that means that the fights are close mm -hmm. and it's two great fighters. Do you feel like he's your best opponent? Yeah, he's one of my best okay. opponents, yeah, of course. Okay. Uh, so, I think okay. the styles make the big fight we mm -hmm. have, and, and, and that's good for boxing. So, so what do you think about these odds? They have the odds so much in your favor, like you're just going to go in there and I don't blip. care. Yeah. I don't care about the odds because when I fought him uh, the last two fights, I, I'm not a favor. So oh, right, and right. I and I win. So, yeah, so I don't I don't pay attention on that too much. The two fights with Canelo have been controversial. The first fight, I personally thought you won the first fight, yeah. like 100 percent. I, I don't know anyone that disagrees. The second fight was very close. Why has it taken so long for a third fight to be made? You know, I'm ready for a second fight, you know, just I don't know why, like, you know, we, everybody wait like four years. You know, I remember my first fight, my second fight, you know, right now, like we have like trilogy. Trilogy is completely different story. Mm -hmm. I hope like same like a first and second fight, like a big, nice, beautiful fight. Did you watch his fight against Bivol? Not like all fight, just only, you know, highlights. Yes. What did you make of his performance? Uh, I'm so sad. <laughs> really? Yes. For Canelo? For Canelo, yeah. Why? You know, he's a big star from boxing, you know, and he looks so, like, horrible. Do, do you think that, again, a lot of people think that maybe you're not the GGG of five, six years ago. Canelo is no longer the same guy, is he, as well? You know, like, he's 32 years old, you know, mm. like, probably right now he... 60-plus like, fights? Yes, yes. You know, he, like, top his, you know preparing you know like a, I don't know just every fight is different every fighter is different you know like sometimes you know like you wake up you have a bad day you know mm. a, a lot of people prior to the Bivol fight a lot of people said that you cannot beat Canelo in Vegas because of the scorecards mm. the judges will always favor Canelo now with the Bivol win mm. do you think now that maybe that has changed yeah probably yeah I hope is everything has changed because Bivol he show everybody you know like it's possible it's a mm -hmm. possible you know, decision, 
yeah, I know like a Canelo he doesn't like you know like a judge you know decision like you know he said I win you know like come on guys like wake up your eyes you know. I think it was fascinating to hear um, from both Canelo there and Triple G. Um, how do you feel watching their interviews, Brett? Oh, come on, guys. I'm so <laughs> sad. <laughs> Yo, his main thing was like, it's possible to beat Canelo on the cards. He's not saying it can't beat Canelo, but beat him on the cards. What, what stood out to me the most was him being so candid and saying he looked horrible yeah. his last fight against Bravo. We all know that Eddie's been trying to get a lot out of him on all the press conferences, and he hasn't been that vocal. Yeah. So you got it out of him, Eddie. Well, you know, <laughs> one, one does try. Um, I think Canelo looked confident and supremely confident, as always, especially considering he's coming off a loss. I was almost watching that interview, looking to see if there's anything there, maybe a crack in his all, always comfortable demeanor. I, I saw nothing. Yeah, no, I mean, I think he's, he has so much to prove to himself. He wants to prove everybody wrong, at least those folks that felt that Canelo won a fight. And he, deep down inside, really thinks that Canelo is a cheater. And he wants to, he pretty much wants to end Canelo's career. I, I, I don't think we've ever seen a GGG this calm. Look, now I'm saying GGG like you. <laughs> there you go, right? We've never seen a Triple G this calm. Look, it's going to be epic tonight. I'm predicting it tonight. What about the way in? Uh, the in both look fantastic. I fought 168 pounds. Obviously, we know what Canelo looks like because we've seen him before. We've never seen GGG this big. And looking at him here, I think he looked fantastic, especially considering his food. Absolutely. We always see Canelo looking this good. And Triple G, he looked bigger, he looked fuller. But then again, Canelo did too. Because remember, against Bivol, he looked a little slimmer, a little more cut. So he looks good at 168 as well. Look, and I'm looking at the size here, Eddie. And you know, Triple G is not that much bigger than Canelo Alvarez. I, I remember when they first fought, the, when they fought the first time, people were saying Triple G is so much bigger. The size difference is not that big of a deal. Yeah, not anymore. I mean, the first fight, 2017, yeah. Canelo's definitely filled out now. This is the guy that's fought a 175 as well. So I'm with you. I don't think he is much bigger. What do you think both fighters will weigh in the ring tonight? Uh, that's a good question. I, I, I think because Gennady has been so used to being at 160. He's a disciplined fighter. We all know his conditioning is always top-notch. I don't see him going that far much up in weight. May, I'm thinking maybe 175, maybe 180. I know Canelo's going to be up there. I think he has a good strength and conditioning coach. That's Chris Camacho. So Camacho might be aware that Canelo is one of those guys that can rehydrate very well. So maybe he's like, you know what? I'm not going to have you going there small. I'm gonna make sure you gain 15 pounds. Yeah, but that, that does, that's not great for all fighters. Some fighters like to be lean, like to feel lean, don't wanna to get to the point where they're bloated and it slows them down in the fight, it affects them later on in the later rounds. Some guys like to remain light. Maybe that might work for Triple G. You're right, and it really depends on what fighting style he's gonna come in the ring with, Triple G I'm talking about. Because if he's thinking he's gonna move, then he should be a little bit lighter. But if he thinks he's gonna go Mexican style like he said, then why not pack on some more pounds? Indeed, that's the thoughts of us. Let's hear now the thoughts of our very own Chris Lloyd and Darren Barker. They've broken down where this fight can be won and lost. You mentioned about, we'll talk about Canelo's uh, footwork and, and his head position just slightly further over that back foot. And you see the rhythm with which he brings his guard up and down. When he's just in range, the guard comes up. When the hands come down, when he's out of range, and there's that. And you see Golovkin occasionally timing him on that and, and realising that actually if he feints the jab, just brings those hands up, knowing they'll come down a split second later, then thumps that jab through the middle. And I guess it's, a, it's just a simple jab off a feint, but it's, it's educated. He's thinking about what he's doing. You cannot make a mistake. I mean, when you watch those fights, it's high-level intelligence. Oh, the concentration's like unbelievable. Like, the concentration from start to finish. You know, and, and if one of them did switch off yeah. for a split second, they got caught. Mm. Uh, uh, and that's what I'm saying. These little adjustments, the faint upstairs, and just get that reaction. If they see a sniff of an just opening, there, they there. will make you pay. Just that faint. <laughs> and then down. You know, yeah. they'll, they'll do it every single mm. time. And I, I, feel, I feel the faint is, is so important. But I, I guess in a nutshell, it's, for me, it's about Golovkin being able to hold the centre ring. And th there was times in the first fight where, yes, Canelo gave up too much ground, but it, there was almost times where Golovkin was running mm. into Canelo, just really getting into a, a, a rhythm and, and a real sort of 
forward march and, and just allowed him to get his work off. I think on the flip side, Canelo's got to be busy, he's got to be smart, he can't give up the ground. I think r battle of the front foot's going to be interesting. Yep. I don't think Canelo, after being in there with light heavyweights, etc., I don't think he's going to go out any ground. I think after watching the Murata fight and seeing Murata hurt Golovkin early, I must admit, I thought Golovkin looked old early on in that fight. I think Canelo's really going to go for this. I think I can be the first to, to stop, stop him. Golovkin. But for Golovkin, it's about trying to somehow... Look, how many times have you heard it? The last thing a fighter loses is their power. Yeah. Can he hurt Canelo? Can he land one flush on the chin? We see a couple where Canelo takes this thing out of the shot. Oh. But can he land that one shot mm -hmm. that could end Canelo? Great to hear from Chris Lloyd and former IBF middleweight champion Darren Barker. Um, look, this fight can go so many different ways, right? And look, Darren and Chris broke it down brilliantly. But I guess a lot depends on how good Golovkin still is. I mean, we saw against Murata where he was hurt to the body. If Golovkin really is the same guy, then it could be special here tonight. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think it's always, you know, to try to predict how a fight plays out. We all know this is the theater of the unexpected. We don't know what's going to happen tonight. We like to guess. We like to think we're experts, but we don't know. It all depends on how Gennady's feeling tonight, and to your point, what Canelo's going through tonight, mentally, physically. But we know that they gel well. Their matchups are perfect for one another. So if they're both going in there with, the, with that aggression, with the chip on both their shoulders, I don't think their styles are going to change much. We're going to get pretty much a mixture of what we saw the first fight, the second fight, just with a little more animosity this time. Indeed it will. Remember, the fight is live on the Zone pay-per-view. Make sure you scan that QR code. We're going to talk so much more about the main event. We've got the first fight, though, tonight on our prelim card. It is Anthony Herrera versus Delvin McKinley. We're going to cross over to our commentary team, McCoy Erdman, and he's been joined quickly hot-footed to ringside. The boxing bully Barack is with him. Thank you so much, Ade. It is time for our opening contest here on the prelims. Anthony Herrera and Delvin McKinley in 150-pound action. You see the measurables very even between the two. Delvin McKinley with a little more professional experience, but Herrera very much the prospect in this matchup on the brink of becoming an Olympian now, making his way through the 115-pound division. It's time to meet the fighters. Let's send it down to Mr. David Diamante. From Delvin, Gator McKinley. Cards. McKinley surprised a lot of people by going the distance with Olympic medalist Nico Hernandez last time out in Wichita, Kansas, dropping a six-round unanimous decision. McKinley has been gradually improving as a fighter as he's essentially DIY'd a career without major backing in New Orleans and is hoping for a breakthrough upset here tonight on the zone. And now entering the arena, please welcome Anthony Superman Herrera. Superman Anthony Herrera has had some hard luck over the last few years in his career. First, he had his Olympic dream taken away by the pandemic. But more recently, he was held to a draw against Canon Valenzuela in a fight he felt he clearly won. Tonight is a new beginning of sorts. His first time fighting as a pro at 115 pounds, the weight he says he's always wanted to campaign at. A four-time national champion, Herrera grew up unsure of the mainstream possibilities for a fighter of his size, but has entered a landscape where fighters like Bam Rodriguez and others are considered the next wave of stars in this sport. Herrera feels that he has the ability to be amongst those names before it's all said and done. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, good evening and welcome to the T-Mobile Arena here in the fight capital of the world, Las Vegas, Nevada, USA. We are live on DAZN pay-per-view for an historic evening of world championship. 
professional boxing. It's all being brought to you courtesy of Mr. Eddie Hearn of Matchroom Boxing, Canelo Promotions, and Triple G Promotions. We're sponsored by Hennessy, Never Stop, Never Settle, DraftKings Sportsbook, action so good, why bet anywhere else? O'Reilly Auto Parts, better parts, better prices every day. MGM Rewards, Fred Loya Insurance, put Fred Loya in your corner, Valaway, and visit Abu Dhabi. All of tonight's bouts are sanctioned under the auspices of the Nevada State Athletic Commission. The chairman is Stephen J. Klubeck. The executive director is Jeff Mullen. Introducing your three judges scoring our first contest from ringside. Kermit Bayless, Lisa Jampa, and Glenn Feldman. And at the sound of the bell, your third man in the ring, referee Celestino Ruiz. And now, ladies and gentlemen, six rounds of boxing scheduled in the super flyweight division. Introducing first, fighting out of the red corner, he wears the gold with the white trim. He scaled 116 pounds. His professional record, four wins, three defeats, one draw, all four of his wins coming by way of knockout. He fights out of New Orleans, Louisiana. Introducing Delvin, Gator McKinley. McKinley. And his opponent across the ring fighting out of the blue corner. He wears the red with the gold lettering. He scaled 114.8 pounds. He is undefeated in his young campaign as a professional with a record of two wins, no defeats, one draw. Both of his wins coming by way of knockout. Fighting out of East Los Angeles, California, ladies and gentlemen, Anthony Superman Herrera. Herrera. Okay, guys, anything below the hips is considered low. I gave you guys your instruction in the dress room. I expect a clean, fair fight start to finish. Good luck. Touch up. And we're ready to kick things off here on Before the Bell. Corey Erdman now joined by Barack here for our opening contest between Anthony Herrera and Delvin McKinley, the first professional bout for Anthony Herrera at 115 pounds after three fights at 118. Now he says he's at his true natural weight and a little bit of a takedown there from Delvin McKinley. Absolutely. Uh, you know, they just very eager. That's all this is. Anthony Herrera, a self-described swarmer in the ring. He loves to throw in combination, throw in volume, likes to get right on top of his opponent's chest and see Herrera there with a nice right hand coming over the top. Good shot to the body there from Herrera as well. Mentioned Delvin McKinley, he's been in tough of late. He went the distance with Nico Hernandez. He was matched up against Emmanuel Rodriguez as well. He's been getting difficult assignments, but he's been willing to take them. You know, they see they're going right at each other, and that's what these six-rounders and four-rounders should teach you, that you don't have the liberty to wait to establish dominance. You got to do it in the first round. Herrera taking a rare step back, and it does him good. Nice right hand connects there from Superman Herrera as he digs back down to the body as well. Oh, another solid right hand there from Herrera. Now, Herrera finding his range well here in the opening round, Barack. We obviously rewatched Herrera's fight against Kenan Valenzuela not too long before the broadcast. And I think we both felt that there were times that Herrera was kind of rushing his work a little bit, that if he had taken a half step back, yes. he might have landed shots like that. I think, you know, the jab is so important in boxing. Every boxer will tell you that. And it's not just to, you know, hide the right hand or maybe even be a power jab, but also range finder. And that's something, if you get away from that, you will have times where you miss a lot of shots. And that's what he's doing now. He's actually, see, that jab is establishing that range. And he's, and he's doing good. It's that sweeping right hand that's land now basically three times in a row. There was one about a half minute ago that <laughs> seemed to knock McKinley off balance. Very encouraging start here for Herrera in his debut, so to speak, at 115. Yeah. 
So far, McKinley doesn't have any kryptonite for Superman Herrera over here. Right hand to the body from Herrera, and here's that swarming style. And this is one of the things that McKinley, excuse me, Herrera and his team talked about, the ability to be a little more physically imposing now down at 115. Terrific start for Superman Herrera. <laughs> Dealing with one of these, you need the free fix finder service from AutoZone. It checks these warning lights to email you a detailed report. It's the most complete free warning light report backed by technician verified fixes. We take a look at the corner of Delvin McKinley. Four, three, and one out of New Orleans, Louisiana. And round two begins. This one's scheduled for six rounds. A good start for Anthony Herrera. And McKinley now starting to go toe to toe with Herrera. Herrera will certainly invite this. I was wondering what kind of advice McKinley's trainer was saying because uh, he's obviously lost that first round, but he came out with some kind of enthusiasm that seems to be working. McKinley, of course, giving up a lot in the way of amateur pedigree. Anthony Herrera, only 55 amateur fights, but four national titles during that time. And just missing the Tokyo Olympics. And, and through circumstances that are obviously out of his control, but yeah. Brock, it, 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 it's something that still really troubles him. You, you know, even talking to Herrera about that, he still gets emotional about that period of his life. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, think about it, that's every amateur's dream. You know, just like Bruce Carrington, they made, they tell you one day, hey, you made the Olympics, and then all of a sudden, you don't qualify. Yeah, you don't have enough points. <laughs> right. I didn't know I was shopping for reward points over here. <laughs> <laughs> See some swelling underneath both eyes of Delvin McKinley now. Good shot there from McKinley. Meets Herrera with a right hand, but it's Herrera obviously doing the vast majority of the damage and of the work overall here. Another chopping right hand connects from Herrera. I think McKinley's looking a little bit discouraged right now and maybe even sucking wind a little bit. There was a right hand right underneath the left elbow of McKinley. And for a fighter that, as you pointed out, Barack, maybe is starting to tire a little bit, that's the last thing you want to feel right now. McKinley has a decent offense. It's just he doesn't have any answer for the offense of Herrera. He's not moving his head. He's not even trying to block shots. Yeah, it credit to McKinley as well, because if you watch McKinley's first four professional bouts, he was really a guy that was getting by on sheer athleticism. And he was able to go six rounds with Nico Hernandez. You know, he, he cleaned up some of his footwork and where he was carrying his hands. But again, he is certainly outgunned by a more experienced pro in Herrera right now. Another body shot from Herrera. What a way to punctuate round two.
on tonight. Canelo Alvarez and Gennady Golovkin going at it for a third time. Also on the card, we referenced him earlier. Bam Rodriguez being our co-feature against Israel Gonzalez. And now round three begins here. Anthony Herrera, Delvin McKinley, and it's been a terrific start for Anthony Herrera, who Barack is, is really showing his stuff from long range and from you know mid-range, let's call it, more so than we've seen him in the past. Yes, he's actually showing a total package. He's feigning, he's double jabbing, he's actually sidestepping, he's doing everything that he probably didn't do when he fought that draw, and I think that chip came on into this ring on his shoulder. And referee Celestino Ruiz resuming the action here. Another body shot from Herrera and a chopping right hand right on the top of the head of McKinley. If you look at McKinley, he has swelling under both eyes because that jab is actually a power jab and that right hand is landing almost every time. Yeah, to your point, Barack, McKinley just doesn't have an answer for that jab right now. He's not slipping it, he's not parrying it. It's basically, you know, he's framing his hands and giving a lane for Herrera to land it right now. Combination there from Herrera, that left hook caught by McKinley. So trying to make some defensive adjustments here. Look at those angles, you see, that um, Herrera is doing. He, he's punching, and he's out of there. When you could throw a hook from long range and land, that's, that's obviously something that McKinley is not concerned about the a moment ago, you might have been able to spot some swelling around the left eye of Anthony Herrera. Hasn't seemed to deter him so far. Fact, maybe it's motivating a little bit. You see Herrera taking kind of an extra step, closing the gap on McKinley right now. Usually that motivates the other fighter as well. Like, okay, I got him hurt. Whether it was a headbutt or not, let me capitalize. Final 20 seconds of this round as Herrera triples up on that left hook. And the body language of McKinley starting to change a little bit, starting to hunch over, maybe selling out to avoid some of these body shots. The timing here will be to his benefit, and he'll make it out of this round. Round four underway. Anthony Herrera and Delvin McKinley towards the end of the third round. We got the sense that maybe McKinley was starting to wilt a little bit, that in particular those body shots were starting to really take effect. And we'll see if Herrera can capitalize here in the early stages of round four. I hate to say it, but I think McKinley had the posture of like almost giving up in round three. He was lunging in with his shots, and he was just taking every punch from Herrera. Come on. 
Hard body shot on the inside. Sneaky one there from Herrera. All of these, you'd have to think, are piling up. You know, this kid from New Orleans, McKinley, is tough. You know, even though he's taking a lot of shots, that's literally the first time the referee said, you know, stop holding. So he's not even trying to hold. Which is tough, but maybe not smart. McKinley offering up a right hand, but he is trapped in the corner right now. This is a bad spot for him. All the leverage behind Anthony Herrera. And he's looking like a fighter who thinks he might be nearing the end. Why did the referee stop that? Oh, maybe, by, okay. Kidney shot behind shot, the back, perhaps. Behind the back. I think McKinley was contemplating going down. He got saved there. The credit to McKinley for standing in here and trading shots. Did he just get his second win? Oh, he's still lunging in. Less than a minute left to go here in round four. A courageous showing here from McKinley, who is just getting battered by Anthony Herrera. Punch is just raining in from Herrera right now. Some of these being slipped, some blocked, but no reply from McKinley. And you see Celestino Marie's taking a hard look. And McKinley might have thrown a few punches at the exact moment. You saw Ruiz taking a step toward them. And McKinley trying to make it out of this round. We'll see what his corner has to say after yet another one-sided frame for Anthony Herrera. underway. So Delvin McKinley back out still in this fight. We certainly had questions about what would happen and there it is. The body shot sends McKinley to a knee. He has taken a lot of those throughout this fight. Hold on, is that going to be considered a low blow? Obvi obviously it was a low blow because he's not counting. No, we're being it was a headbutt. You see oh. McKinley now blinking. Okay, let, let, let's call Academy Awards because this is, this is the time now. This, this is the time. Take as much time as you want. You got five minutes. He looks like he's really in pain, though. Yeah, that eye does not look good. And it does appear, you know, we're hearing the instructions of the judges to score the round, so it would appear that this fight will be waved off. So this will go to a decision. Again, a gutsy effort from Delvin McKinley. I'm sure we'll get another look on how that headbutt transpired. Initially, it looked like it might have been, a, but there was a body shot there being body, thrown that's what it was. and a clash of heads at the same time. Right, that's exactly what it was. Okay. 
Well, prior to the ending, Brock, you'd have to say an impressive outing from Anthony Herrera, just in terms of the, the stylistic changes that we saw from him, just that half step back and the ability to kind of put his punches together from long range, as we see. The side stepping as well, the double jabbing. Oh, yeah, there's the headbutt right there. So it was, so it was a body shot as well, but that headbutt. Simultaneously. The four-time national amateur champion, Anthony Herrera. I'm sure this is not the perfect ending that Herrera wanted, but he does know that he was dominant. He did a lot better than last fight, and he did get the victory. Unofficially, of course. I think it was a good lens into how Herrera will be oper will be able to operate now at 115 as well. I think, you know, last time out against Ken in Valenzuela, he was doing many of the same things, but I think, you know, he was met with a guy in Valenzuela who was a little bit stronger, who was able to push him off sometimes. I think that Herrera, and I think he knows this, his type of physical style is going to play better the lower down in the scale. <laughs> as light as you can get on the scale, it's going to be better for Herrera. Yeah, I think in the fighter meetings, we kind of got that from the corner. Like, you know what? We need to go down and show our dominance at, at a lower weight. Decided to take a couple of fights at 118 to start his pro career. They said because it was a little easier to find opponents, but also he had spent so many years making 114 as an amateur that didn't want to tax his body during some of those early fights. See the swelling on the left eye of Herrera as well. He'll certainly feel that a little bit later on. I wonder if that's happening from my headbutt as well. Even though this ended by a headbutt, it, it was, I really want to know what McKinley said to the doctor that made them stop it. Did he say, I can't see, I'm seeing double, what? I mean, the eye does not look good. <laughs> so I, I believe him if he says he can't see particularly well out of that eye. Right. So this is not going to be one of those times when a fighter says, oh, he hit me low. And as soon as they call out the fight, he's like, okay, I'm up. I'm good. Where's my lunch? Well, it definitely doesn't look like that. But we are ready to make this one official. So let's send it down to David Diamante. Ladies and gentlemen, referee Celestino Ruiz calls a halt to this contest. The official time of the stoppage, 19 seconds of round number five. Because of an accidental headbutt, we now go to the judges' scorecards for a technical decision. All three judges scored about 50 to 45 for your winner by technical decision. He's still undefeated, Anthony Superman Herrera. Anthony Herrera. Still undefeated, now 3-0 oh, and 1. Erasing the memory of that draw with Kenan Valenzuela to a certain degree. And a nice performance here in our opening contest. And he had an opponent in McKinley Barak who allowed him to, to show off his offensive arsenal in this fight. But <laughs> well, that's what you're supposed to do. You know, you're supposed to do what's expected of you. And he did it well. He did it with class and he did it with patience. 50 to 45 across the board, a technical decision for Anthony Herrera. Well, plenty more still to come here from the T-Mobile Arena. Next up in the ring, it'll be the unbeaten duo of Aaron Aponte and Fernando Molina going head to head after this short break. I wonder who Conor Ben fights next. A lot of speculation about Conor. Yeah, Connor there's maybe. a lot of options on the table. Furman, Brown, Danny Garcia. Did he go maybe Avenisi in European title shot? A lot of people have been asking about that one. Love it. Love the Ugas fight.
What Connor Ben does have is options. Who's next? 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 Who's
How would those guys feel? Like you're coming out, obviously the arena isn't full yet, yeah. but you're coming out, you're on a Canelo undercard, all the build up, all the week, all the interviews, surely this is almost a carrot being dangled in front of them. Like, look, you guys, this could be you. Right. You could be here in a couple of years time headlining him. Yeah, and I know you were thinking, Adam, we talked about it off camera. You know, what is it like for a young fighter to fight in an arena without that many people, pretty much empty? You think about the aura, the, the fight week, what you're a part of. You know, when you go back in history and you talk about the trilogy, Canelo versus Triple G, hey, I, I fought on that card. No, no, I wasn't there. I fought on that card. I scored a knockout on the card. You're part of history. I know it's nice to be in a smaller venue, have a nice crowd. Keep winning, you'll get there. Yeah, another fighter on the undercard that we're going to see a bit later is Mark Castro, who seems to be fighting on every single Canelo card. Obviously, 7-0, was going to risk his undefeated record today against Mendoza. I like Mike Castro. We've seen him have tough fights, right? He's, he's been cracked a few times as well. He's been more, but he's gone down. But every time I see him, he seems like we're seeing improvements. Yeah, you know, sometimes you want to get tested early like that. You know, what, what's bad is a fighter fighting guys that are put, posing no threat. By the time he's ready for a big challenge, he's not prepared for it. So, yes, he's had some tough fights, very aggressive fighter. When you're in a line of fire like Castro, when you like to mix it up, you're going to get hit. You're, you're going to take risk in there. But he's fighting guys. I think they're bringing him up properly. He's fighting guys that are giving him a test, a stronger test every time. Today is going to be his biggest test. Indeed, it will. Look, we're ready for our second fight of the night. It is a battle of the unbeaten. Aaron Aponte against Fernando Molina. Our commentary team are ready. Let's head straight over to them. Corey Erdman and the bully, the boxing bully, Barack. Well, very interesting matchup here in our second contest on Before the Bell, a matchup of a matchroom prospect and a Canelo Promotions prospect, both undefeated Aaron Aponte and Fernando Molina. You see Aaron Aponte, very impressive measurables, six feet tall, 76 inch reach. Would be a lot for Molina to contend with, but this is a good looking matchup on paper. We're ready to meet the fighters. Let's send it down to David Diamante. Ladies and gentlemen, our next contest of the evening, it's an eight round super lightweight attraction. And now making his way to the ring, please welcome Fernando Ferroz Molina. Fernando Molina turned pro at the age of 16 and quickly found himself surrounded by an all-star cast. Discovered by Hall of Fame manager Shelly Finkel, Molina is also under the learning tree of the Reynosos and Canelo Promotions in Guadalajara. While his friends have been out partying and generally being teenagers, he's been chasing after his dream of becoming world champion, fighting on a series of major undercards. But after a difficult outing last time against Ricardo Valdivinos, Molina will face a coming of age moment in the ring tonight, the toughest test of his young career. With his idol and mentor fighting in the main event tonight, Molina wants to get Team Canelo off to a winning start here on Before the Bell. The 8 0 Fernando Molina. Very slow walk to the ring. Entering the arena, please welcome Aaron, the Alien King of Ponte. As a child, Aaron Aponte dabbled in many different sports as a 114 pound defensive back in football, as a baseball player, but he always found himself drawn to fighting, even coming to blows in the dugout on more than one occasion. Aponte channeled his love of a fight with his natural athleticism and transformed into a highly touted boxing prospect, one who now sits at 6-0. 
Aponte battled sweltering hot conditions in Guadalajara to earn a split decision victory over Leo Leon Martinez last time out. And instead of taking a step back, Aponte and his father specifically requested the undefeated Molina as his opponent for this card. February 5th is Aaron Aponte Day in his hometown of Hialeah Gardens, Florida, but he wants September 17th to be a day that he makes headlines in the boxing world. The Alien King, Aaron Aponte, one of the most unique nicknames in all of boxing. Well, I guess that Bernard Hopkins is retired and he's a Hall of Famer now. There's room for another alien. Are the aliens up for grabs? Because <laughs> you can't have two aliens in boxing at the same time. Monte says he got the nickname from his father. He used to watch him work out and was marveled. He was marveling at what his son was able to do in the gym. And he said, you're an alien. <laughs> the nickname yeah, has stuck. This should be a good one. Ready to send it down to Mr. David Diamante. Ladies and gentlemen from the T-Mobile Arena here in Las Vegas, Nevada, USA, live on the Zone pay-per-view, we are set to go with a special super lightweight attraction. It's all being brought to you courtesy of Mr. Eddie Hearn of Matchroom Boxing in association with Clase y Talento and Canelo Promotions. We're sponsored by Hennessy. Never stop, never settle. DraftKings Sportsbook. Action so good, why bet anywhere else? O'Reilly Auto Parts. Better parts, better prices every day. MGM Rewards. Fred Loya Insurance. Put Fred Loya in your corner. Valaway and visit Abu Dhabi. Introducing your three judges, scoring this contest from ringside. Chris Migliori, Ricardo Ocasio, and Don Trella. And at the sound of the belt, your third man in the ring, referee Robert Hoyle. And now, ladies and gentlemen, eight rounds of boxing scheduled in the super lightweight division. Introducing first, fighting out of the red corner, he wears the white with gold and red trim. He scaled at the super lightweight limit of 140 pounds, bang on. His professional record, a perfect one. Eight fights, eight victories, three of them coming by way of knockout. Presentando de Lomas del Paraíso, Guadalajara, Jalisco, Mexico, Fernando Ferroz Molina. Molina. And his opponent across the ring fighting out of the blue corner. He wears the red and gold. He scaled 139.8 pounds. His professional record, also a perfect one. Six fights, six victories, two of them coming by way of knockout. He fights out of Hialeah Gardens, Florida. Here is Aaron, the alien king of Ponte. Aponte. All right, let's go, boys. Okay, gentlemen, we went over the rules in the dressing room. Any shots on this belt line is a legal punch. Anything here will be legal. I want a good, clean fight. Protect yourself at all times and touch them up. Scoop back. We certainly always love to see this, Barack. Two prospects with eight and six fights, respectively, match tough at this stage in their career. Two prospects from different promotional bodies as well. Of course, this happens, but we would always love to see it more often. <laughs> this must have been an accident. <laughs> Round one underway. Aaron Aponte and Fernando Molina. See Aponte in the red trunks trimmed with gold with the Alien King logo on the waistband. Fernando Molina in the white trunks, Mexican colors throughout with the yellow tassels. The difference in height is, is it's not as bad as I thought it would look. What about you? Well, I think that it you know, Pate's kind of dipping at the knees a little yeah. bit, maybe to level himself out and land some of those body shots like that as they trade. 
Good exchange there between Aponte and Molina. I've seen Aponte before fight tall, fight long, fight from long distance. That's why this surprised me. Well, remember, as we mentioned, Aponte's team specifically requested Molina as the opponent here. And they said that they felt that after watching Molina's bouts, particularly his most recent one against Ricardo Valdovinos, they feel that he's unable to make adjustments. And that once they get him past round three, Aponte's team feels that Molina's just going to run out of ideas. Good shot there from Aponte leaping into the left hook. Aponte is one of those kids that, like Zab Judah in the amateurs, had a lot of knockouts. Usually guys that even have knockouts in the pros didn't have a lot of knockouts in the amateur rankings. Good shot there from Molina, a left hook that landed high on the head of Aponte. Molina certainly throwing his shots with conviction here in the early going. Steps in with a jab to the body. Aponte looking for that right hand. Certainly doesn't hide the fact that his bread and butter is that straight right hand, as you might expect for an orthodox fighter with his dimensions in this weight class. Yeah, absolutely. And also, it's different from the McKinley-Herrera fight where you can see where one is more dominant from the beginning. One is the A side, one is the B side. These two look evenly matched. Shot to the body there from Molina. There's some sneaky work of the body again from Molina. Both fighters definitely having their moments here in round one. Good counter left hook. Aponte landed there. He sensed a pattern, I think, from Molina flurrying to the body and just waited for his opportunity to land that left. Yeah, but I, I think it's smart for Molina to be going to the body this early. Oh, there goes a the mouthpiece. Terrific opening round between these two undefeated prospects. Really? Really. Free testing and charging? And if you need a new one, we've got you. Welcome to America's number one battery destination, AutoZone, your battery solution. Round two begins. This one's scheduled for eight. Aaron Aponte and Fernando Molina, as it projected on paper, a very well-matched contest here. Aaron Aponte won five national championships. Fernando Molina won a junior national championship in Mexico, as well as an array of state and regional championships as well. I thought I'd see more of that, and that's Aponte using his reach with that jab. He double jab, another double jab there. Molina looking for more body work. Aponte trying to lean back and counter with a left hook once again. Yeah, now we're seeing a different Aponte. You are seeing one who, if he's going to attack, he's going to attack from long range, and he's going to counter. He's not going to stay in there and bang like he was doing in the first round. Molina just trying to work his way to the inside. This is another element of Aponte's game that he was talking about. You know, that, that spring in his step and utilizing some of the athleticism, but mixing it with a little bit of pro polish. <laughs> Being the taller fighter, usually taller than everybody, you usually don't see that. So I know he does look like an alien to everybody when they're across the ring from him. 
Monte maybe getting a little too playful there. Gets cracked with a right hand from Molina. <laughs> Molina again with a right hand, and now he's feeling a little looser. See the hands at the side of Molina as well. Both men building confidence here in the second round. Oh, there goes a headbutt. And Aponte gave him a little smile, and you know what that means. It means, uh, yeah, you caught me. Good shot. See, I think we've been two minutes in, and Aponte has forgot that he started off the round with a great jab. Another body shot there from Molina. Climbs the ladder with a left hook as well. And a right hand comes over the top. Oh, Molina thought about a shot behind the head. Thankfully thought better. We're inside the final 30 seconds of this round, and the tempo really picking up as Molina hits the canvas. That was not a knockdown. All right, that looked like a balance issue. We'll look at it on replay. It looked like Molina had actually landed the better shot in that exchange. Exactly. But the judges will be forced to score it as it was officiated. Let's take a look at the replay here. Right. And again, in, in real time, it looked like the feet got tangled, but... Did you see a punch land by Aponte? I saw a great punch landed by Molina, and they were body to body, and we need a different angle. So potentially a very tough break for Molina there. But officially it is a knockdown scored by Aaron Aponte in round two. As round three begins. Let's see how this makes Molina react, you know, being down 10-8 already. Good shot there again. And Molina, you know, maybe that was basically the same sequence. Like, he almost lost his own balance throwing so hard. <laughs> and hits the floor once again. That one, luckily for him, not scored a knockdown. A little combination there from Molina. Monte not using his jab as actively as he did in round two. Aponte takes a good body shot. Aponte almost mirroring the approach of Molina right now, just jumping in with hard body shots. I think in the beginning of the round, Aponte was missing some shots. Molina was kind of showing off his head movement, his foot movement. And Aponte said, okay, I got something for you. I'm going to go to the body. Closing in on the final minute here of round three. Both Aponte and Molina with good moments in this round, but that right hand connects from Aponte. You know he's hunting for that. That's definitely not a secret. He and his camp very open about that, and now Aponte starting to open up. He does say that's his money shot. He just got to set it up with the jab, you know, because Molina knows it's coming. for a counter uppercut. You see now, Ponte, remember he was uh, had that spring in his step. He was on his toes. Now he's flat-footed because I, I think he wants to, you know, land some power shots. 
Ponte showing some different looks here. It certainly felt like despite the knockdown, it felt like maybe there was some momentum heading towards Molina, but Aponte with a terrific finish to this round. Can be called super fights. This is one of them. There's a score to settle. And can even test your battery. Alternator, check engine light, and more. Back live here in Las Vegas as we take a look at the corner of Fernando Molina. A family affair for him. You see Balthazar Molina, his father, Alexis Molina, his brother in his corner. Across the ring from him. Aaron Aponte's father, Reniel Aponte, also in the corner with Michael Robles. So round four begins. Back and forth matchup between two undefeated prospects. A debatable knockdown in round two. Certainly looming large at this point. But even despite the knockdown, as we were doing, Discussing in round three, it felt like maybe Molina was starting to, to build a little bit, get some momentum, but Aponte really closed out round three very well. Yeah, and I think that's just a testament to him being able to adjust what he said he learned in the amateur ranks. You know, I'm tall, I'm long, I can fight on the inside and the outside. And that's what I think he did, he adjusted. Molina's getting a little bit more brave with the leaping left hooks, a la Roy Jones Jr. But going back to what Aponte's corner told us, Aponte and his team, as another clash of heads. It's been an epidemic so far here on our broadcast. It ended our first fight. As we were saying, this is around the time that Aponte thought that Molina would start to wither, but look at this. It's the time he's turning it on. Molina all over Aponte, who's on wobbly legs. Another right hand drains in. Corey, I think Aponte already recovered. Molina certainly emboldened by what he saw. We'll see if Aponte could gather himself here. You're right, his legs, at least right now, well, they look more stable than they did before. And Aponte still firing back. <laughs> that looks like a man that recovered right there, that comment. Yeah, good left hook from Aponte, but Molina comes in behind another right hand. Both these men put in a 50-50 matchup for the first time in their careers, and this is what we discussed. This is why you want matchups like this against prospects. This is definitely gonna prepare both of them for their future careers. I just think that Aponte should go back to the jab. He shouldn't be having this tough of a fight with a guy that's that much shorter than him. Not to say that Molina's not good, but he's just short, and he should be fighting it from long range. Molina sneaking an uppercut in there as well. Aponte has managed to recover, but a statement round for Fernando Molina. Aponte in the previous round. There's the clash of heads early in the round. Here it is. They actually both landed at the same time, but Molina's was just flush. Well, 
You gotta tell, you gotta tell. Round five begins, and Aaron Aponte certainly had some degree of difficulty with Leo Leon Martinez in his last fight, but nothing like what he just experienced in round four. He hurt and wobbled for the first time in his career. There's a right hand again. Aponte lands one, so does Molina. You know, this is just a night of chips on shoulders because they both actually come off of split decision victories in their last outings. Hard right hand in the body from Molina. Ponte landed one of those about 10 seconds ago as well. This is a great fight by two young prospects, both undefeated. Oh, no. Uppercut there from Molina. And a wobbly step again from Aaron Aponte, who gets rocked with a left hook. Oh, he's really hurt now, Corey. Aponte in serious trouble right now. He is getting battered around the ring. Another left hook connects from Molina. An eternity of time for Molina to work with. Can Molina capitalize here? Aponte still very unsteady. Aponte showing a lot of toughness right now because that was a flush uppercut and he ate a couple of right hands. And this is the matchup that they specifically asked for, but it is certainly not going the way that they had anticipated. It's a really good left hook by Molina there. Mouthpiece out now from Molina. And that will buy Aponte some additional time. Brock, what do you think right now? How do you evaluate this? Is Molina taking his time and being patient, or is he being too patient? No, I, I think that Aponte is still throwing hard shots. I mean, yes, he was wobbled. Yes, he was hurt, but he kind of gained his foot. And look, see, he's swinging hard for the fences. So Molina's saying, I still got to be careful. We've seen Elvis guys like Joyce, perhaps. Right. Molina. Yeah, we've seen guys like Sergio Mora knock down Danny Jacobs because coming in too crazy after you hurt the guy. Final 30 seconds of a round that it looked for a while like Aponte might not make it out of it. And another right hand lands from Molina. An uppercut and a chopping right, right behind it. Down goes Aponte. Ponte with some steps that look a little unsure towards the referee, but time is on his side here as round five will come to an end. Let's take a look at the replays here, Barack. Aponte landed a really good hand that did not face Molina at all. But it was that uppercut right there. It was the right uppercut by Molina that really hurt Aponte. There it is. The wild with him. Now. And I'm glad he caught himself because he could have landed another shot with momentum. Round six underway. Fernando Molina putting Aponte on the canvas for the first time. Aponte has been hurt in two consecutive rounds now. Molina was technically on the canvas in round two. So if we do go to the scorecards, that'll factor in. But there's no question which way the pendulum is sitting right now. 
Again, a matchup that Aponte and his team specifically asked for. Probably not going the way that they forecasted. No, not at all. And Molina on paper even up the score with that knockdown, but the only difference is that Aponte is actually hurt. Molina was never hurt. Well, it was Aponte who was lauded as the budding power puncher in this matchup, but right now it's Molina who has done more damage by a wide margin. That's a very good point, and it's just something to say about a properly placed punch, you know, that really gets you out of there. Another counter right hand from Molina connects. Ponte still at this point. There he offers a jab, but Rocky's doing a lot of moving right now. But I think it, it, it's safe movement. He's not offering a whole lot. He looks to me like a fighter who's still recovering. Yeah, but you, as, as a fighter, as a taller fighter, you could still be at least fainting, throwing a couple jabs, even if they're lazy jabs and you're keeping your distance not to get hit, just to let your fighter know, I'm still in this. Don't just show him that I'm hurt and I'm avoiding you. Just missing with that right hand. There's a nice right hand to the body from Aponte, who's sporting some something between swelling and a cut underneath his right eye. I think Aponte is really good at masquerading how hurt he really is. I mean, this is certainly a courageous effort from Aponte, he hasn't experienced this at any point in his career. Hard body shot from Molina. Aponte trying to stand in there and counter now. And we got two rounds left, uh, depending on how the judges have it scored. Aponte still has a chance to, you know, pull off a victory. Take a look at the corner of Fernando Molina. Excuse me, this is Darren Aponte's corner. His father, Reniel Aponte. In a situation they have yet to be in. See Jacob Stitch Duran also in the corner of Aponte. A handy man to have around when there's an abrasion under your eye. One of the best in the business. So we'll see how Aaron Aponte reacts here in round seven. You made a good point in round six, Brock, which is that this fight is not out of reach for Aponte at all. I think it's just about Aponte taking the right style to finish off this fight, which is long distance. There you go, jab, just like that. Oh, right hand connects there from Aponte. I think Aponte now realizing he can't just move at this point. This is a fight that is not out of reach. And he certainly has the power that if he can stand in there and counter with those uppercuts and that right hand, it's not out of the question that he could hurt Molina as well, but Molina with a beautiful uppercut on the inside. I think he found the punch. <laughs> I think he found the punch. That's the punch that hurt him earlier, and I think he's trying to land it again. But if Aponte was fighting at long distance, that would never land. You see some blood coming from the mouth of Fernando Molina as well, and some tape loose which will get tended to as well. Hey. 
Molina has his foot on the ropes. <laughs> He's like, I'm, I'm going to really rest right now. <laughs> you might as well just sit down on the ropes. Why is, where's his corner? <laughs> I, I see the ref doing something, but where's his corner? If there's something wrong with the glove. You see some Aaron Aponte fans in the first row as well, giving some additional instructions. This might be a bigger issue than just tape, because I don't know why. Yeah, we're taking a look at the surface of the glove here, but no, looks like the referee's gesturing to maybe rewrap it. Let's see. Because he brought him to a neutral corner. Yeah, maybe the stitching ripped in the glove. Because, oh, yep, because they're taping it now. Okay, that's good. Stop in. I mean, very unusual to see this, but also, I mean, that creates an, an abrasive surface on the outside of the glove, doesn't it? That's it does, and it can also scratch. Yeah, it can scratch it. Here we go. Here we go. Come in. I've never seen that happen before. So, an extremely unusual circumstance here. We'll see how it affects both fighters. We'll see if we might be able to get word from down ringside. When it comes to that decision, well, one thing I can say to Aponte just had a nice time to recover, catch his win, and now he's back on that jab. Good exchange there on the inside. Both men trading left hooks. Good right hand over the top from Molina again. And a nice flurry that ends with a left hook on the inside from Molina. Now Aponte taking a step back and gets driven back to the ropes. Good work there from Molina. Barack, you pointed out that maybe Aponte would come out of that break refreshed. Whatever momentum was there, Molina just took it right away. <laughs> now Molina turns the tables and tries to flurry. We heard a muscle memory. Well, I think there's uppercut memory. <laughs> I think it's just lingering damage that Molina caused on Aponte. I mean, supposing we get to the corner at the end of round seven. Oh, look at that. A nice right hand from Aponte. It's the shot that he's been looking for all fight long. That's why I posed the question, if we make it to the end of the round, it'll be interesting to see what happens with the glove of Molina. Do they swap it out for a spare? Do they let him fight like this? A very unusual circumstance here in the midst of a terrific fight between two undefeated prospects trading shots now in the center of the ring. We'll take a look at some of the replays from round seven. Oh, beautiful inside work by Molina. Combination starting with the uppercut, of course, and left hook. And Aponte showing his grit as well with his combinations. Just landed a great right hand at the end of the punch after Molina slipped the other two punches before that. Molina has to be confident right now, especially his corner, you know, going into this round. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the eighth and final round. So the eighth and final round of an action-packed bout between Aaron Aponte and Fernando Molina. Both men have touched the canvas, although the knockdown of Aaron Aponte much more consequential as he was badly hurt after that and was hurt in the previous round as well. But again, not necessarily a fight that's out of the reach 
of Aaron Aponte, depending on how round seven was scored and depending on what happens here in the final three minutes. Agreed. And I see uh, rising prospect Xander Zayas watching. And, you know, he's probably a little concerned for Aponte. That was a great shot by Aponte there. Well, one thing we can see is the Ponte's back on his toes. <laughs> back on his toes, trying to be long again. Fainting, jabbing. That jab connected right before that one. The one thing we have to point out, I mean, this is a five foot six fighter against a six foot fighter. And Molina really hasn't been bothered by the jab of Aponte, either because Aponte hasn't been offering it all that much, or because Molina has done a good job slipping it or just stepping out of the way of it when it has been thrown. Right. He's not throwing it enough, I would say. And, and a flickering jab doesn't necessarily hurt, but enough flickering jabs. Whoa. Ooh, another right hand connects from Molina as Aponte now taking a backward step once again, now trying to circle out and create some distance. Molina, another terrific right hand, and places one now along the belt line. I just don't understand why Aponte's even letting him in that space. He knows how to dance. He knows how to move. we got one minute left to really capture this, this fight. Final minute of the contest. And Fernando Molina having himself another terrific round as Aponte is doing a lot of moving right now, but if you're in Aponte's corner, do you not want him hunting for something big here in the eighth, considering that these scorecards could be all over the place? Yeah, of course. I mean, you would be telling him to use the jab, not just move. Oh, that was a nice slip and uppercut there that uh, Aponte landed on Molina. It's like Molina snuck a shot in there as well, as he is all over Aponte, who's trying to roll with these shots along the ropes with 20 seconds remaining in the contest. Final 10 seconds. There's nothing wrong with jabbing and jabbing and winning a round with a jab, especially if you've been hurt already. Both men try to flurry at the bell, and that was a terrific fight between two undefeated prospects. Again, we mentioned it off the top. This is why you want prospects at this stage in their career matched with one another. Yes, there was no surprise here. These guys were matched like this pur uh, purposely, and we got what we expected. A great fight. Team Aponte got what they asked for, and perhaps a little bit more <laughs> in this matchup. Team Molina on the shoulders. Of Baltazar Molina as we take a look back. Right hand from both Aponte and Molina, but it's Molina who stayed in there at the end of the exchange and landed that bonus left hook. Yes, and it just seems like the more damaging shots was by Molina, you know, even though they both land at the same time. The body language very different in these corners right now. This this corner, Fernando Molina's corner, looks like a team that believes they've won. I don't know that I could say the same about Aaron Aponte. It's definitely the winner's circle over here in the red corner. You can see the father of Aponte. Doesn't look too enthused. Doesn't look too happy. Understands that his son was in a tough fight, but there's always hope. But again, credit to Aponte, not just for taking the fight, but for requesting it. Well said. Ponte. You know, a, a very interesting young man to talk to. Very intelligent young man. We'll see if he will retain his undefeated record. Looks like the decision is in. We can send it down to the center of the ring to David Diamante. Ladies and gentlemen, after eight rounds of action here at the T-Mobile Arena, Las Vegas, Nevada, we go to the judges' score totals. They read as follows. Ricardo Icasio, 
76-74 for Fernando Molina. Chris Migliori, 76-74, Adam Aponte. And Don Trella scores this bout. 75-75, we have a split draw. So a split draw. And I'm sure supporters of Fernando Molina are gonna have a lot to say about that decision, Brock. Oh, that's a tough one. It's a tough one because, you know, when you're watching the fight from where we're at ringside, it's like we're not able to score the fights round per round. But it, if this was a fight on the street, we know who won. And, and that's the thing. And it's like maybe they each won the equal amount of rounds, but one was punished more. And that one who was punished is Aponte. So a gutsy effort from Aaron Aponte to eke out a draw. A terrific fight between Molina and Aponte as advertised. Plenty more action still to come here from the T-Mobile Arena. Next up in the ring, it'll be Mark Castro and Kevin Montiel. So don't go anywhere. Y la gente empieza a gritar Canelo, el nombre de Canelo, muy increíble. I remember hearing that there's a new guy from Mexico touted to be a great. The crowd is electrified. This kid loves it. You just don't fight Floyd Mayweather at that age. Why would you do that? Y pues al final de cuentas yo quiero hacer historia. Ahí está, mira el golpe, ese. Ese fue un golpe muy importante en la pelea. The two Triple G fights were two absolute wars, two epics. That jab opened up a cut on the eyebrow of Canelo. That second fight was for all the marbles. I felt like if they hit me with something of steel or metal. It's over! They say that for all action there is a reaction, and that was my reaction. Fight fans, welcome to the DAZN Boxing Show. Bringing you all the exclusive news, interviews, and outspoken views from the world of boxing. I'm back in beast mode. The fight starts now! Catch the latest boxing news every single weekday. I'm gonna be honest, man. That kid's pissing me off. This is what boxing's all about. From the best fighters to the biggest promoters. Give me some fucking props. The boxing world is going to be buzzing. No one takes you closer to the fight game than the DAZN Boxing Show. Arena atmosphere is starting to build here for what will be, I think, one of the best trilogies we've ever seen. Remember, the action is live on the zone page. If you the QR code on the screen, make sure you scan that. You really don't want to miss any of the action. Very quickly, at that fight we just saw between Aponte and Molina, I thought Molina won that fight. Yeah, you know, that's a classic case of a fighter not using his attributes and the other one using them very efficiently, meaning Aponte did not use the size, did not use the jab. He started with, started well, was able to put him down. But after that, uh, uh, you know, he, he just got, let him get too close, got hit with big right hands over and over again. So, I don't know, I'm not sure if it, I'm not sure if it went the right way. All right, let's get ready for our next fight. The other member is Mark Castro, the unbeaten Mark Castro, versus Kevin Montiel Mendoza. Let's cross over to our commentator, Corey Erdman, the boxing bully. Time now for our next contest. The catchweight just above the lightweight limit. One of the blue chip prospects in the matchroom stable, Mark Castro, taking on Kevin Montiel, who, as we'll talk about, has been in there with a blue chip matchroom prospect in the past and has performed very well. You see the advantages very much in the favor of Mark Castro, both in terms of the measurables and in amateur experience. Let's send it down to the center of the ring to David Diamante.
Ladies and gentlemen, our next contest is an eight round lightweight attraction. Set to make his ring walk, please welcome El Conan, Kevin Montiel Mendoza. So as mentioned, Kevin Montiel has been in this position before. In 2020, he was brought in as an opponent for matchroom prospect Otha Jones III and battled him to the draw, bursting the hype bubble of one of the company's original U.S. signings. Tonight, Montiel enters the ring with his own promotional deal, a fresh contract with top Mexican outfits and for promotions, and is once again facing off with a blue chip matchroom prospect. Odds on Montiel are as high as plus 1550 tonight. But he feels that he's already set the precedent of defying the odds in a fight just like this one. And now making his way to the ring, please welcome the undefeated Mark Castro. As part of a new wave of a social media savvy boxers, Mark Castro has had plenty of viral posts over the years, but there's one that's been pinned to the top of his Instagram profile for a while now. A picture of him and Canelo Alvarez. To him, it was a transformative moment. Both the attention the post brought him, but also the endorsement from one of his fighting heroes. Tonight, he's part of the same event as Canelo, a long way from the Castro family garage, where he and his father engineered two world amateur championships, training at temperatures that rain from 30 degrees in the winter to 120 degrees in the summer. The confines are a little cozier these days, but the focus on a world championship, this time the pros, remains the same. And that path continues here in Las Vegas. Ladies and gentlemen, from the T-Mobile Arena here in Las Vegas, Nevada, USA, we are set to go with a special lightweight attraction. It's all being brought to you courtesy of Mr. Eddie Hearn of Matchroom Boxing. We're sponsored by Hennessy. Never stop, never settle. DraftKings Sportsbook. Action so good, why bet anywhere else? O'Reilly Auto Parts. Better parts, better prices every day. MGM Rewards. Fred Loya Insurance. Put Fred Loya in your corner. Valoue and visit Abu Dhabi. Introducing your three judges scoring this contest from ringside. Eric Cheek. Max DeLuca and Dave Moretti, and at the center of the bell, your third man in the ring, referee Tony Weeks. And now, ladies and gentlemen, eight rounds of boxing scheduled in the lightweight division. Introducing first, fighting out of the red corner, he wears the green with red and white trim. He scaled 135.2 pounds. Professional record, six victories, one defeat, two draws, with three wins coming by way of knockout. Presentando de Ciudad de México, Distrito Federal, Damas y Caballeros, Kevin El Conan Montiel Mendoza. Montiel Mendoza. And his opponent across the ring fighting out of the blue corner. He wears the silver with purple trim. He scaled 134.4 pounds. His young professional record thus far perfect. Seven fights, seven victories, five of them coming by way of knockout. Fighting out of Fresno, California, here is the 17-time amateur national champion and the two-time amateur world champion, Mark Castro. Castro. Caballeros, ustedes reciben sus instrucciones. Mira, aquí está bien, aquí no, aquí está bien, aquí no. Dedos en todo para arriba, aquí no va a plena pía. Escúcheme, cuídate, listos, vámonos. So, time to get another look at Mark Castro, who is hoping to avoid the struggles 
that Otha Jones III had with Kevin Montiel here tonight. And round one is underway. Last saw Kevin Montiel dropping a six-round unanimous decision to Christian Zacharias in April of this year. Winless in his last three fights, but again, his performance against Otha Jones is the one that stands out. It's likely the one that got him a Zanfer contract, and no doubt is the reason he was chosen to test Castro here tonight. Well, Harry, he slipped a, a, a nice right hand already in the first minute of, of the fight already, landed on Castro. It's a good shot. Castro just got him. Yeah, good shot over the top there from Castro, who now brings that right hand right down the middle. <laughs> You know, in fighter meetings, we were talking to Castro and his father, Tony, about Castro's style. And I think you pointed out, Barack, that what Castro does doesn't necessarily look like it's right out of a textbook. But his father gives him the ability to improv improvise a little bit and then just kind of tie these things up. Yes. You start with the basics and then you put your own flavor and your twist to it. And that's exactly what Castro does. But he's lucky his father allows him to do that because some trainers are like, no, stop playing around in that ring. Well, it certainly worked for Castro in the amateurs and has thus far in the pros. We mentioned the trophy case at the Castro family home, full of amateur championships, national championships, world amateur championships. I think he's smartened up since the time he was dropped. Um, in the second round a couple of fights ago because even though in that fight he, he took over and he won every single round, you know, he knows, you know, fooling around a little bit too much, leaving his hands down a little bit too much, putting his head out there can get him clipped. Of course, that fight against Julio Madeira a couple of fights ago, as you mentioned, he was dropped and, you know, responded well. And he was telling us about that moment. He said that what was going through his mind at that point he just said, don't worry about it, lose the round. The round's already gone, don't worry about it. Let's get back to the game plan. I love that he said that, and, and I think he's such a young guy, you know, 23 years old, thinking like that, that shows what his father put inside him. I wish other fighters would think like that. Lose the round, relax the ego, it's okay, come back better the next round. The combination there from Castro a moment ago, a double left hook to the body, finishes the combination with those jabs that have been landing at will thus far. There has been some good work from Montiel to the body as well, but Castro just continuously popping the head back of Montiel with a nice stiff jab. And that stiff jab was from the south pole position and switched right back to orthodox. Good start from Mark Castro. Some good action here in the opening round. Supplies everything for your vehicle in one convenient place. That's O'Reilly Auto Parts. Dealing with one of these, you need the free fix finder service from AutoZone. It checks these warning lights to email you a detailed report. It's the most complete free warning light report backed by technician verified fixes. here in Las Vegas. A good start for Mark Castro against Kevin Montiel. Coming up next here on Before the Bell, it'll be Diego Pacheco and Enrique Palazzo. No doubt plenty of people tuning in to see Mark Castro. Big social media following, a good friend of Ryan Garcia's as well, who uh, Castro tells us gives him Instagram tips all the time. Yeah, well, he learned from the best. Ryan Garcia is social media king. If, if I could just see the straight hand from Mark Castro, just a little bit straighter instead of round, I think it would reach the point a little bit better. Mentioned the new promotional contract for El Conan, Kevin Montiel. And that's what makes this an interesting matchup, too, because oftentimes with, you know, hot prospects like Castro, you'll get fighters who are coming in on relatively short notice. They themselves don't have promotional backing. Montiel had a full camp in, pre in preparation for this, right? This, this is not your typical type of prospect matchup for Castro. Yes, that's why I love tonight's 
whole incredible lineup, how everybody's matched up perfectly. These guys came ready. We definitely seen that in the last fight. An overhand right there connects from Castro. Good volume from both fighters here in round two. Montiel getting back to the type of style we saw from him against Otha Jones the, the third, excuse me, and you just saw a nice left hook from Montiel as Castro now goes back down to the body. But Montiel kind of got away from that hyper-aggressive style in his two most recent fights, particularly against Christian Zacharias. Looked like he was trying to be a little bit more of a, a compact technical boxer. But now Montiel back to his old ways. Castro certainly dealing with it quite well, though. He sure is. I think Montiel, you could apply pressure, but you need to move that head off that line. You can't just keep your head in the same spot trying to apply pressure. That jab is really crisp by Mark right now. Final minute here of round one, excuse me, round two. You know, Brock, we mentioned the temperatures in the Castro family garage getting as low as 30, as high as 120 when they were training for all those amateur tournaments. Apparently one Christmas, which they didn't skip training on Christmas, by the way. It got too cold, so they had to train in front of the Christmas tree. That's how dedicated Castro was during his amateur career. Wow, you're talking about gifts. You're stepping on gifts, breaking gifts. <laughs> Montiel looking for a right hand. Castro meets him with a nice counter left hook. It's funny that you say all of that because Castro also admitted that he just really started liking boxing maybe a few years ago, 2019, when Canelo fought Kovalev. I mean, I'd want to open presents rather than work out on Christmas, too. <laughs> Especially coming from the guy that said he would act like he's sleeping so that uh, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't have to go boxing. <laughs> here. Live here in Las Vegas as we take a look at the corner of Mark Castro, his father, Tony Castro, at the helm. Looking to improve upon his undefeated 7-0 record here on our live prelims from the T-Mobile Arena. Round three begins. Kevin Montiel. Using the, the strategy of attrition, basically. I mean, he's hoping to get to the inside and kind of grind Castro down. But Castro's just been able to stand at mid-range, basically, and meet him with almost everything he wants to throw. Yeah, I think um, Mendoza's taking, well, Montiel is taking too many shots, you know, coming in face first, trying to get his shots, but he's getting picked off mid-range, like you said. Body shot there from Castro. Montiel tries to reply as well. And this is something that we've seen from Castro throughout his pro career. He's not, ex he's not afraid of these exchanges. In fact, I think he welcomes them because he thinks he's going to come out on top. Yes, I, I believe he trusts in his, in his uh, chin. And also, when you've already been knocked down and you've gotten up and you took control of the fight, that says a lot. That gives you a lot of confidence to move forward. You know, Castro's um, reach is not listed on BoxRec, but uh, it looks like he has some long arms. I love the way he fights for the distance. He's throwing those shots from down the, down the block. He certainly has good proportions, and, and it's interesting. You mentioned the long reach, but Castro bends at the waist. He leans in to some of these exchanges. Yes. It's almost, it, it gives you the impression that he's not quite as long as he is. <laughs> That's a good point. And, and coaches will tell you, never do that. You never, you know, put your chin past your knee and it looks bad. But it, we know Montiel is not capitalizing on those mistakes. Castro looking for a chopping right hand. 
found an uppercut up the middle a moment ago as well. There's a nice shot from Montiel over the top. Less than a minute left to go here in round three. And Castro briefly switches southpaw, eats a right hand, says, well, forget about that. <laughs> Let me go back to where I'm better at. I think, I think Montiel's still in this game, and as long as he gets in there, I, I think he needs to implement a jab, you know? And that's the thing, he's just throwing these hooks, trying to get inside. One major consideration here is that although Castro last time out against Pedro Vicente trained for an eight rounder and was originally scheduled for an eight rounder, it only wound up being a six because it wound up being a swing bout. This is a true eight rounder. So this kind of tempo being cut by Montiel, although Castro is getting the best of these exchanges, you do have to ask the question, what does this look like in round six, seven, and eight? That's a good question, especially in that fight against Pedro. I thought Castro kind of, you know, got a little gassed, maybe caught a second win, but he was showing that it was a little bit tough just doing those six rounds. Let's take a look at some of the work from Mark Castro in round three. Went to the body with a nice right hand. Kind of got grazed by that right hand from Montiel. Good left, good left uppercut from Castro. And he got caught in the end of that right hand by Montiel. Castro showing the speed, you know, with his counter punching with that left hand, that left hook. four underway. We saw the uh, very obvious hand motions from uh, Montiel's corner. Clearly, they want him to work up the middle a little bit. Use those uppercuts because you see the posture of Castro, who willingly likes to lean in. That's how he fights. Perhaps there's a lane there for Montiel. Yeah, but that uppercut that they're talking about, when it's available, would be a counter shot. And, and he, Montiel has to show that he can do that. Uh-oh. That was a right hand on the top of the head. That's illegal. And pretty boy Tony Weeks <laughs> says, stop that, Castro. No hammer fists. <laughs> and we're back to the action. Well, th that's a good point, Brock, about the counter shots from Montiel. When Montiel has faced uh, opposition that isn't as good as Mark Castro, one thing he has done well is kind of slip to the outside, land a left hook to the body. Counter left hooks are typically his game. Did sneak one in there just a moment ago. Yeah, but you know what it is? It's that Castro is just very good at distancing, and he's taking that away from Montiel. He's not giving him that. But one thing I can say is, yes, what you said earlier, Castro is leaning in, and that's where the uppercut is available. Good right hand connects there from Castro. A pair of right hands. Now starting to put his punches together. Some of those falling short from Castro. A nice little sequence. From the pride of Fresno, California. Oh, good shot there from Montiel, but that will be ruled a slip. Castro off balance. Castro told us that he believes that right now, or maybe in the next year or so, he feels that he could sell a stadium out in Fresno, California. He thinks he could put 40,000 people in a stadium in Fresno. I heard that, and I thought it was strange, but hey, he's the hometown kid. He knows his own town, and maybe so. And he said, you know, I'm not trying to brag, <laughs> but I think I could sell it out. Montiel still trying to march forward here, trying to find his way onto the chest of Castro where he can bang away to the body. Again, it's, the, it's that deceptive range we keep referencing from Castro. He gives you the idea that he'll meet you forehead to forehead, but then he steps back with a right hand just like that one. And that was a straight right that I said I was looking for. That was very nice and on point. Oh, 
Good shot there from Montiel, but Castro replies uh -oh. right away with a shot that has hurt Montiel. Montiel on wobbly legs right at the bell. And a stutter step onto the stool from Kevin Montiel. Kevin Montiel in big trouble at the end of the round as we take a look at what happened. That was an overhand right that landed, and Montiel was trying to say to Tony Weeks, like, oh, that was behind the head, as he stumbles back to his corner. Kevin Montiel hurt at the end of the previous round. We'll see how Mark Castro reacts here. Does he jump on Montiel in the early stages of round five? Castro, five knockouts thus far in his pro career. Oh, hits Montiel with another right hand as he's looking for number six. I just think Castro is a smart fighter, man. He's going to the body, trying to get Montiel to drop that hand so he can get that overhand right again. Montiel just trying to get something working here, offering a couple jabs, but that's the more meaningful work. It's these combinations from Castro and the body language of Montiel not looking promising at the moment. Castro starting to open up. Crowd members here early at the T-Mobile Arena starting to get a little more vocal as they're sensing that Castro might be on the verge of knockout number six. Montiel really starting to wear down, again complaining about a shot behind the head. He is not getting hit behind the head. <laughs> He's just trying to, you know, get a way out. That's it. He's getting hit in a lot of places. That may be one of them, but a beautiful uppercut, and that is it. Wow. What a shot from Mark Castro. Protect yourself at all times. Stop complaining to the ref. He was already showing he was hurt throwing wide shots, but let's just hope he's okay. Well, now our thoughts turn to Kevin Montiel, who has yet to move after a vicious uppercut knockout by Mark Castro. Hold that fool. Mark Castro a little muted in his celebration as we wait to see that Kevin Montiel is okay. Now you hear the crowd starting to liven up. But what a shot from Mark Castro. And uh, that one will look good on his Instagram, Barack. <laughs> Absolutely. I know it's early in the night, but that sounded like there's a crowd out there. <laughs> I mean, that That's might be knockout of the night, regardless of what happens. Oh, man, he slipped that perfectly placed punch in there and got him out of there. What a way to try and steal the night. And we're still waiting on an update on Kevin Montiel. And you see Eddie Hearn, the promoter, obviously thrilled with what he saw there. And we are thrilled to see this. Kevin Montiel back up on the stool after a scary, scary knockout from Mark Castro. Certainly a big statement from Mark Castro. Oh, wow, what a shot. 
absolutely beautiful uppercut, which we'll take a look at in just a moment. You see Mark Castro bowing down in prayer and out of respect for his opponent. And here we go. Let's take a look at it. Oh, right, right into it. Uppercut. Let's see it from a different angle here. Kind of slipped the jab, stepped in, right uppercut, put him to sleep. Slip, jab, uppercut. There you go. Well, that's how you draw it up in the gym. They don't always land that way. Yeah. But that is as perfect an uppercut knockout as you're going to see. It was a lazy jab by an opponent that was already hurt. Mark Castro improves to 8 0. Perhaps the most impressive performance of his young career. Certainly a moment that would be watched many times after this. See him pointing to the waistband, the pride of Fresno, California. Well, he gave some he gave Fresno something to look for in the future when he does sell it out in Fresno. And you know what, Brock? During fighter introductions, both of us, when our mics were off, we looked at one another and we were like, our cast was looking strong today. The yeah. definition on his body looks like someone kind of growing into his body a yes. little bit, and maybe there's a connection there, the power that we saw from Castro and the physical changes we're seeing him undergo. You know, every young fighter is always wondering when they're going to get their man strength. When is their body going to stop growing and, and, and they're going to look like a man? And I think this might be the time that Mark Castro is getting it all in one. Good to see Kevin Montiel being tended to back on the stool. Tough kid can leave this uh, arena with his head held high. He's been willing to take these tough tests. Again, Otha Jones, yes. Mark Castro, he's tested himself. He gave it all he had here tonight. But Castro, there's a reason, there's a lot of hype around Mark Castro, and he showed why tonight. I think he showed that he can be disciplined. He didn't play around that much in this fight, you know, even though sometimes that works as well, too. But he showed he can be disciplined. He showed he can counter punch. He showed he can walk the fighter down. Excellent display. I'm excited. We saw three great fights, and we still got another fight to go on the prelims. Checo and Colazzo up next. It should be an exciting one as well. But now Montiel back up to his feet for the first time yes. since the knockout. Let's hope the crowd give him a round of applause, you know, for his efforts. I love the sportsmanship in the two camps right there. Montiel's corner were calling for uppercuts prior to that last go. round, and it was an uppercut from Castro that ended it. There we go. This is what I wanted to see here. This is what I wanted to see. A round of applause by the man that gave this, this all in that ring. It fell short. Somebody has to lose. All right. Looks like we are ready to make this one official. So let's send it down to David Diamante. Ladies and gentlemen, if we could get a nice round of applause, please, one more time for these two warriors. Thank you. <laughs> Referee Tony Weeks calls a halt to this contest. The official time of the stoppage, one minute, 40 seconds of round number five. Your winner by knockout, he's still undefeated, Mark Castro. Highlight reel knockout from Mark Castro as he improves 2-8-0. Oh. We'll be back with more action right after the break. Times can even make you or break you. It was tough, but it made me. 
this was the moment that Anthony Joshua became a major star. I was just shouting at him, like, come on, let's fight, where are you running? Joshua's going for the finish. And, that... and this is the, uh, the passion of Dylan White. This is absolute I thought there was going to be riots in the crowd, I really did. In the space of six years, he'd gone from being a raw novice to going in with one of the greatest heavyweights of all time. Klitschko down for the second time and all over the place. You're one shot away from, from trouble or disaster at any point. You have to dig deep, and they're the type of fights that people remember for many years to come. The very best action from around the globe. From free running to Formula One and everything in between. This is the place to see exceptional athletes doing extraordinary things. Whether it's near impossible challenges or life-changing journeys of discovery, these are the innovators pushing the limits of possibility. Incredible moments, unforgettable stories. Welcome to the new home of action sports. Welcome back to the T-Mobile Arena. We've got one more fight for you coming up on our live prelim before our main card gets under. Remember, the action is live on the zone pay-per-view. Make sure you scan the QR code. You don't want to miss any of the action. Good win for Mark Caffrey, who takes his record to 8-0. He's ringside right now with Justin Shack. Mark Castro picking up his first knockout of 2022. Congratulations, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Take me through the moments before that uppercut. What were you seeing that led to that execution? I see a lot of uh, shots open. Uh, my corner, my dad was telling me uppercut, uh, like Eddie Hearn, and was telling me uppercut. So like, I'm like, they see something, so might as well throw the uppercut. Did you feel like you heard him at the end of round four? Yes, I, I see it and I felt it, and I felt him getting tired as rounds were long, but I didn't want to push on the gas. Now I got eight rounds, I know I got time to work. You mentioned your father, Tony said at the end of round one, he felt like you could take him out. Did you sense that as well after the first? Yeah, I asked him because he sees things that I don't see, so I got to take his instructions, I take his word for it, I trust him, and uh, so I just kept working, kept doing what he told me to do, and that's how we got came out with the knockout. All right, you are the foremost social media expert around here. You're over 750,000 followers on TikTok, close to 300,000 on Instagram. Does that go viral or what? I hope so. Yeah. I hope so. Mark, congratulations. 8 0 now. Thank you. Appreciate it. A big win there for Mark Castro. Good stoppage as well. It's very good to see as well that Kevin Mendoza is okay. Got up after what was a very, very big knockout. Um, in the end, Mark Castro takes his record to 8 0. He's obviously a lightweight prospect. And this is what we want, right? We want to see guys. You know, take their records, get that man strength as well that like we see Mark Castro have. All in all, good performance. And, and also, when a guy knocks people out like that, the promoter, the network, they say, we want that guy back out. People like that. That's what the fans want. And he's get. I mean, he's an aggressive fighter. Look, you're not going to get, everybody's not going to be slick and, and, and very defensive because you got to be, it, to be that aggressive, to, to score those knockouts, Eddie, you have to be in the line of fire. He takes risk and he gets rewarded like that. Big win for Castro. Yeah, he's making improvements all the time as well, isn't he? When you watch him fight now, look, we've been quite critical of him in terms of his foot movement, right. in terms of his hand speed. But I feel like we are starting to see improvements with Mark Castro. Yeah, no, no question about it. I mean, he, he, he's, he's doing he's doing a lot of, uh, uh, he's doing better defensively, head movement, good body attack there. Like you said, progression, he's getting better every fight. Yeah, and, and that's what we want to see, right? Again, with, with these prospects, sometimes we can be too overcritical, especially, especially me and you, we yeah, can. I, yeah, like, we, yeah, we overdo it sometimes. This is the guy yeah. that's not had double-digit fights yet. This is the guy that's stepping up in competition, stepping up in rounds. He knows his week as well that he could, he's got the engine, which is important. And I like Mark Castro. I think this is a very, very good prospect. Oh. And I am look forward. Oh, that's a beautiful yeah, I mean, uppercut. The way he slips the jab, Comes in, bang. perfect timing, it viral is. type of knockout. And I like a young fighter that takes advantage of a fighter being hurt. You see a guy hurt, you smell blood, you attack. He did what he had to do and got him out of it. Now he has a viral clip that's about to go out. Yeah, I've asked you on the other fights we've seen so far, with the guys winning, is it a case of putting them out again straight away, like a Mark Castro? 
He always seems to fight on the undercard of Canelo. Do you just put him on the undercard of someone else? Do you give him activity? Yeah, right right away, especially with a knockout like that. Like I said before, at, at this stage in a career, these guys need to go out every three months at least, especially if you're not suffering any punishment. Get him out there. Make sure in 2023 you step him up. Yeah, indeed. All right, let's go and talk about the main event. This is what everyone's here for, isn't it? Everyone's here for the trilogy of all trilogies. Canelo versus Triple G. Again, we're so close to it. Make sure you scan the QR code. You don't want to miss this fight. Um, what can we expect? Can we expect fight? Can it be as good as the first two fights? Can it? Uh, absolutely, it can. Listen, I, I tell, I tell you what. I right, look. Before you get into that, we are going to talk more about the main event. Obviously, look, so much to talk about with Canelo and GGG. Let's find out both about more fighters coming up. Your winner by majority decision and new WBC, WBO, IBO Ring Magazine middleweight champion of the world, Saloon Canelo Alvarez! Un momento de felicidad grandísimo para nosotros. Como equipo fue una pelea muy importante para nosotros. Soy una persona que no llora mucho, pero esas veces que no, no puedes asimilarlo, la verdad es que son sentimientos únicos. Él está mi familia ahí, mi esposa, mi, mis hijas, eh, mi mamá, mi papá, mis hermanos, mis amigos, todo mi equipo. Para mí es muy importante y significa mucho. ¿Por qué? Pues porque la familia, al final de cuentas, es lo, lo más importante para nosotros. The way that he boxed in, in those fights surprised a lot of people against Triple G. You know, particularly the, the second fight where he chose just to come forward, you know, and, and meet Triple G and head on. Took everything from Triple G. You know, the most fearsome puncher in the middleweight division, one of the biggest pound-for-pound -pound punchers in the sport. You know, that was the fight that made everybody say, this man is a machine. El hecho de que el mejor boxeador del momento sea mexicano, eso es motivo de muchísimo orgullo. Canelo es un deportista que nació de hueso colorado deportista. No puede parar de competir. Más de la mitad de esa carrera ha sido criticado y sin embargo ahora es el rey de los Libra por ella. Un verdadero boxeador mexicano. Fueron dos peleas muy buenas que tuve con él. La verdad es que son de las mejores peleas que... Que, que he tenido en mi carrera. By the way, I absolutely love that documentary. It talks about how this third fight has been made. I love them both honest about the first two fights as well. It's great to see them looking at the fight and always becoming, taking our jobs, right? Becoming <laughs> analysts, right? And looking at the performances of both. It sets, up, it sets up something special, doesn't it? You know, Adam, when I, I talked about this early in the week. The amount of pressure that Canelo has had since he was 21 years old, we can't overlook that. I mean, this guy's been scrutinized. He's been under a microscope his entire career. He's had a country, an entire country on his back. You know, ever since Oscar De La Hoya retired, you got the Julio Cesar Chavez scene that he's compared to often. He's had to perform at a high level ever since. No, no, no question, no exception today. So people are expecting him to be the typical Canelo Alvarez. Coming after a loss, a lot going through his mind, a lot of pressure, a lot of, I don't want to use the word hatred, but a lot of animosity towards Triple G that Canelo has. And people are expecting him to win. I mean, look at the odd makers. He's a heavy favorite. That's a lot of pressure on a 32-year-old. Certainly is. Look, you can see the countdown on the screen. There, we've got less than an hour to go until the main car gets underway. Make sure you scan the QR code. Remember, that is the pay-per-view portion of this fight card. We've still got one more fight card on the prelims as well. The weigh-ins yesterday, Ak. I mean, I've been to some weigh-ins back in the UK. You've been to a lot of weigh-ins here in the US. I haven't seen a weigh-in like that ever. Listen, I mean, talk about the crowd stampeding past the barricade as soon as they open those barricades. Hundreds, 
rush to Hundreds, be the first. Thousands. No, no, I mean, first, of, of course, thousands were there, but I mean, it was almost dangerous. I thought people, some people were going to get stop, stopped. But listen, look, look at this typical stare down. I mean, these guys are professional, elite athletes at the top I, I, of their game. I, you know, we, we've seen we've seen Canelo do a few naughty things at press conference. Sorry, yeah. that way he face down sometimes. I thought he might do something here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I thought maybe he might shove, do a little shove, a little, he moved the head, nothing. I think the respect they have for each other is the reason these guys just stay there and look at each other. And by the way, I counted a minute 30 seconds. <laughs> Listen, they I, stayed at each other for a minute 30 seconds. I'll be honest with you. I know a lot of people like to shove in and a little commotion and drama. I like this stare down for this long because I like to see who breaks fir first. Yeah. Who's the first guy to look away? That was it's a real trilogy. stare down. These guys do not like Canelo. each other. Canelo trilogy does his little three. shadow boxing after yeah, everything. He always does that. He always does that. <laughs> Yeah. Um, GGG, a lot's been spoken about his age, now 40. He looks fantastic, didn't he, on the skulls? Let, let's not talk about his age until we see him get old. People keep mentioning age. Do I have to mention a great Bernard Hopkins and what he was able to do older than Triple G? Listen, Murata was a young killer, and Triple G took care of him, broke him down systematically the way he normally, normally does. Why do people keep bringing up the age? Let the man look old first before we start calling him old. Yeah, indeed. Uh, training camps has been interesting as well. We've seen some behind-the-scenes stuff with uh, Gennady Golovkin at Big Bear. He loves Big Bear. You know, when he goes to Big Bear, you know it's he's business. serious. Oh. It's business. <laughs> yeah, all the fun stuff is out of the way. It's serious. No, no doubt about it. And listen, I mean, I don't know. I haven't heard who he's been sparring with, but Big Bear always has great sparring. You're known for that. All the top level guys, they, they, they're paying top dollar for sparring. Trust me, he does not want to lose this opportunity to settle the score with Canelo Alvarez. I believe we're going to see the best Triple G that we've seen in years tonight here in this arena. I'm happy you said that because a lot of people have been speaking about his last few performances against Morata. Look, Morata was an unbeaten world champion in his backyard. But in terms of opposition, we haven't really seen it. No disrespect to the likes of Zaramata and Steve Rolls. They're not Canelo. Right. So we do need to see the Canelo of maybe almost four or five years ago. Right. I mean, we can talk about that opposition, but guess what? This guy's already shared the ring with him for 24 rounds. He has the experience for that type of style. He's been in there. I mean, and, and listen, of course, Canelo, obviously he's the type of fighter that always gotten better every fight, but he's familiar with that style. And I said it about it. I said, I said it yesterday, Addy. Sometimes a guy that has that many fights consecutively, like Triple G, needs a break. So maybe that inactivity is going to serve him well tonight. I truly believe that. Let's talk about Canelo's sort of fighting, per se. Canelo's had over 60 fights. 60 fights is 60 fight camps. So many sparring sessions. He's been fighting since he was 15 years of age. Surely, and you hear the phrase a lot, father time. He catches up with everyone. I know he still looks in fantastic shape. He's only, what, 32 years of age. But 60 fights is 60 fights. That's a lot of wear and tear on the body. And it's not only fights. Like you mentioned, it's the training camp. It's the rounds. It's the sparring. It's the all making that. weight. And it's funny. You talk to Canelo and you tell him, hey, listen, you've accomplished everything there is to accomplish. You already have a Hall of Famer career. He's about to have a trilogy under his belt, win, lose, and draw. When do you want to hang it up? That's not even nowhere on his radar. He does not want to stop fighting any anytime soon. I, don't, I mean, he's mentioned maybe 36, 37, 38. This man's mentality is, I love this sport. I'm not going anywhere. That's a great sign for a fighter that's going to be fighting tonight. You've spoken to Canelo so, for so long, right? I mean, every time you speak to him, he sounds very, very confident. Um, he did lose last time out very quickly. Mentally, where is he? Well, this is where he is where he's at. Mentally, where he was after he lost to Floyd Mayweather. We all know what that loss did to him, and I, and I keep talking about this. I've been talking about it all week. He's the type of guy... Hold that thought, hold that okay. thought. The fighters are ready for our last prelim fight. Remember, it's Diego Pacheco versus Enrico Galazzo. WBC United States, 168 pound belt on the line. Let's cross over the commentators one again of Corey Erdman and the boxing bully Barack. Pacheco taking the biggest step up of his young career against the Olympian Enrique Colazzo. You see Diego Pacheco, a massive super middleweight, 6'4", a 79-inch reach. Enrique Colazzo, not a small super middleweight either, but looking up at Diego Pacheco here today. Ready to meet the fighters, let's send it down to David Diamante.
Ladies and gentlemen, our next contest scheduled for 10 rounds in the super middleweight division and now set to make his ring walk. Please welcome Enrique Kikin Coyazo. Well, the career of Enrique Colazzo hasn't gone exactly as he'd mapped out coming out of the 2012 Olympics where he represented his native Puerto Rico. After fighting to a draw in his pro debut, Colazzo says his career went into something between a tailspin and a holding pattern due to a lack of or poor management. Colazzo says that the opportunities he has been offered have been on short notice or for short money, but that tonight he's finally had ample preparation and notice for a big chance. But while the big opportunities haven't been there for Colazzo in live action, they have been in the gym, where he's been preparing with a host of big names, such as Gabe Rosado and Jean Pascal, trying to make good on a trajectory-altering chance here tonight. And now entering the arena, please welcome the undefeated Diego Pacheco. The 21-year-old Diego Pacheco has grown up before our eyes here on the zone as nearly every single one of his fights have been aired on this platform. But it was one, a vicious first round knockout of Selamani Saidi on the undercard of Joshua Ruiz II in Saudi Arabia that caught the eye of Canelo Alvarez and prompted him to invite him to his training camp. Pacheco has used lessons learned in the gym with Canelo as he's grown his record to 15 and 0 and now finds himself rubbing shoulders with another champion in David Benavidez as he's now trained by David's father, Jose Senior. His new team says that they're fine-tuning his style to best make use of his immense physical gifts as a six-foot-four super middleweight with a heavyweight reach. Once again, it is the biggest step up in the career of Diego Pacheco tonight. We are ready. Let's send it back down to David Diamante. Ladies and gentlemen, from the T-Mobile Arena here in Las Vegas, Nevada, USA, live on DAZN pay-per-view, we are set to go with a special super middleweight attraction, and it's all being brought to you courtesy of Mr. Eddie Hearn of Matchroom Boxing. We're sponsored by Hennessy, Never Stop, Never Settle, DraftKings Sportsbook, action so good, why bet anywhere else? O'Reilly Auto Parts, better parts, better prices every day. MGM Rewards, Fred Loya Insurance, put Fred Loya in your corner, Valaway, and visit Abu Dhabi. This bout is sanctioned under the auspices of the Nevada State Athletic Commission. The chairman, Stephen J. Klubeck, the executive director is Jeff Mullen, and the World Boxing Council. The president, Mauricio Suleiman, the supervisor is Joanna Aguilar. Introducing your three judges scoring this contest from ringside. Tim Cheatham, Lisa Jampa, and Patricia, Patricia Morse Jarman. And at the sound of the belt, your third man in the ring, referee Celestino Ruiz. And now, ladies and gentlemen, 10 rounds of boxing scheduled for the vacant WBC USNBC Silver Super Middleweight Championship. Introducing first, Fighting out of the red corner, wearing the green and yellow. He scaled 167.8 pounds. His professional record, 16 wins, two defeats, one draw, with 11 wins coming by way of knockout. Hailing from San Juan, Puerto Rico, Enrique Kikin Collazo. Collazo. And his opponent across the ring fighting out of the blue corner. He wears the white with red and gold trim. He scaled 167 pounds. His professional record, a perfect one. 15 fights, 15 victories, 12 of his 15 wins coming by way of knockout. 
He fights out of South Central Los Angeles, California. Here is the former eight-time amateur national champion, the hard-hitting and the undefeated Diego Pacheco. Pacheco. Okay, guys. Your belt is high, it's high here. We're gonna go below the hips, slow, consider low. I gave you guys your instruction in the dress room. Keep it clean, keep it fair, good luck. Well, we've referenced this as being the biggest step up in the career of Diego Pacheco for Enrique Colazzo. Physically, he says, this is the first time I've ever looked up at an opponent in a live fight. Diego Pacheco, six foot four, a 79 inch reach, putting his undefeated 15 0 record on the line against the 2012 Olympian Enrique Colazzo. Round one, scheduled for 10. See Diego Pacheco in the white trunks, trimmed with the Mexican flag, Enrique Colazzo in the green and gold trunks. You know, in the fighting meetings, Colazzo was just so confident that he's just way above Pacheco when it comes to skill level. You know, I'd like to see that tonight. You know, I know understand in the amateurs, he's he's fought guys that, you know, either today challenge for titles like Terrell Boucher or, you know, Luis Arias. But Diego Pacheco is not that regular prospect, you know. He's tall, he's strong, he's rangy, and he has a high IQ for a young fighter. Colazzo says that he just hasn't been given the opportunities that he expected in the pros so far said it wasn't long ago he was offered a fight against Callum Smith during the, the beginning of the pandemic, but said he didn't want to take that offer, again, according to him, on three weeks' notice. Yeah, especially that, that fight was at contracted at 175, and, and we gave fights at 168. Checo now in his second fight with the new camp that we referenced, with Jose Benavidez Sr. now in his corner. And he said it was a real wake-up call for him, getting into that Benavidez camp, being around David Benavidez, of course, Jose Benavidez Jr. as well. And he said he did have that kind of eye-opening moment when he stepped in the gym on day one and realized, oh, you know, I'm not the best one in the gym anymore. I, I need to step up to their level. Every fighter needs to go through that. Maybe some guys who are um, champions already, when they reach a plateau, they need to go through that, you know. And I think it's... A, a wonderful experience to be sparring against guys like Jose Ramirez, uh, David Benavidez, you know. You, you have to be levels above what your age would show. And, you know, I've been talking about chips on shoulders <laughs> all night. But Colazzo definitely got a chip on his shoulder because he's been a pro for so many years. He was in the 2012 Olympics. And most of those guys who were in the Olympics from America either have titles already. You know, Jojo Diaz has been a champion. Errol Spence has been a champion. So I know he's like, yo, my time should have came five years ago. Right. And, and so he's entering this fight with a mindset to whatever degree it's true. But he believes it, that he's been avoided. You know, he that. There are reasons why he's not getting these fights, but he believes he's in the right spot at the right moment here tonight. Well, either he's showing patience or he's showing respect for Diego's power. You know, none of them has really landed anything substantial yet, as of yet. Slow moving opening round here. Both men just measuring it with their jabs. I think the one who has to do the most adjustment is Palazzo. When I say adjustment, I just mean that he's not used to fighting guys that tall. Trust the friendly and knowledgeable parts professionals at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Our professionals know what it takes to get the job done right. Really? Really. Free testing and charging? And if you need a new one, we've got you. Really? Welcome to America's number one battery destination. AutoZone, your battery solution. Here in Las Vegas, Nevada, take a look at the corner of Enrique Colazzo. Colazzo, part of the same team as uh, Richie Rivera, who recently fought on the zone on the Usyk Joshua 2 undercard. He fought Badu Jack to a draw. 
Round two begins. Slow start for both Diego Pacheco and Enrique Colazzo. They're more or less at a, a standstill, kind of batting one another's lead hands away. Sizing each other up. I think it, it looks like Colazzo's not doing much, but he's actually keeping Diego away, you know, by just doing that pouring jab, just keeping him away, not letting him set up his offense. One of the things that Jose Benavidez Sr. said that Pacheco does particularly well is the ability to land to the body from long range. Again, because of that reach, you see right there, a feint to the body comes over the top of the right hand. And that right hand, it, it had a little effect on Colazzo. <laughs> Colazzo waved him in after that right hand landed. Diego is using his distance very, very well. Good footwork, backing up. Checo's team feels that they can break Colazzo down in this fight. They wouldn't go so far as to say that they'll definitively knock him out, but you read between the lines, there certainly is that belief in Pacheco's corner. Uh, giving a man respect, uh, he is a veteran, <laughs> so to speak, hasn't, you know, fought the top yet, but he is a veteran, came into the game with a crew cut, has long dreads now, been in the game that long. <laughs> Colazzo also, as we mentioned, a guy who gets calls from high-level fighters. And they want good work in the gym. Colazzo has been getting those calls. He hasn't been getting the phone calls he wants for fights. <laughs> but when we talk about Gabe Rosado and Jean Pascal and Logan Paul as well, a frequent sparring partner of uh, Enrique Colazzo, although I'm, I'm not ready to lump him in as a high-level fighter quite yet. Oh, okay. Good wrestler. <laughs> well, he's 21 years old. You know, speaking of the Paul family, like him... Pacheco fighting on Logan Paul KSI, I think that actually is good preparation for the future. You know why? Because those kind of fans don't give you no kind of leeway. You know, you have to prove that you are somebody for them to cheer for because they don't like boxing. Right. <laughs> Neither fighter really able to get their jab working thus far. Now you see Pacheco trying to bring it back downstairs. Colazzo mirrors him, tries that, and Pacheco counters with another right hand. Really, the, the two times that Pacheco has got Colazzo to react, he's landed a right hand. There hasn't been much going on, but the little that has happened has been from the right hand of Pacheco. Just enough of Pacheco to win the round, landed a couple of shots. Slow rounds like this, that's all it takes. Certainly a round in the bank for Pacheco. Very few fights can be called super fights. This is one of them. There's a score to settle. They saw it. Lots of unique ways to experience Canelo Triple G3 here tonight. Of course, live on the zone pay per view later on as we take a look at the corner of Diego Pacheco. Jose Benavidez Sr., just a correction from earlier, this is the third fight they've spent together. Really, the, the second full camp. They've now spent together as Jose Benavidez Sr. Likes what he has to work with, with Diego Pacheco as round three begins. And you know, in, in asking Jose Sr. about how he's molding Diego Pacheco, I asked, you know, your son is obviously very big for his weight class. Are you kind of used to working with fighters like that? And he, he kind of discarded that in, in a sense because Pacheco is not a fighter that he wants working on the inside. He admits that's not Diego Pacheco's strength. He's a long-range fighter who can break you down with power shots. That was a very good question and very good observation. And I think Jose Benavides is exactly right. And I love trainers like that who don't try to train their new fighter like their old fighter. Lazo looks for a right hand downstairs. Good counter there from Pacheco. 
Pacheco says that his natural mentality is that of a counterpuncher. And so far, again, it, it's been a relatively slow start here in the third round, but all of the, the punches of consequence have been counter shots from Pacheco. Got to commend Pacheco on his patience right here, you know, because the crowd might not be happy. I understand he's probably, probably not happy, but he's having patience. He's doing great countering. He can't get it in with the right hand yet, but he knows how to pick his spots. I also think that part of building a prospect is giving them different looks, right? I mean, last time out, it was an interesting test for Pacheco against Raul Ortega, who was a, a big physical fighter, a guy who I think a fight prior had fought at cruiserweight, was able to push him off. Now you have Enrique Colazzo, who's not going to take too many chances. It's a totally different tempo of fight. And Pacheco is handling the challenge to this point quite well. One thing I noticed is that, I mean, Pacheco's not landing, that was a good right hand landed by Colazzo, but Pacheco's not landing a lot. But when he does land that right hand, I see a reaction every time in the face of Colazzo. Colazzo said that he felt that Pacheco would be too slow for him and he'd be able to outsmart Pacheco. He's certainly attempting the latter strategy by really slowing down the tempo of this fight. Pacheco to this point landing just enough. Around 20 seconds of round three. This one scheduled for 10. Pacheco comes up short with a right hand there. Blazo starting to get a little more vocal in the ring as well, but he'll eat a right hand seconds before the bell. We take a look back at some of the action from round three. Palazzo's taking what he can get, which is the body, because he can't reach the head of <laughs> Pacheco right now. Just giving him a little tongue action. Round four now underway. Diego Pacheco and Enrique Colazzo are a feature bout here on the live prelims. Just over half an hour to go before our main broadcast. Canelo and Triple G, the trilogy. See the QR code on your screen every once in a while. You know how to order. What are we coming to? You could just <laughs> put your phone up to your TV and order the fight. I like that. <laughs> Make it real easy for you. And if there's any fight you want to order, it's Canelo Triple G3. Well, both men, Pacheco and Colazzo, still scanning with their lead hand here, looking for openings. Pacheco kind of dropped his lead hand a little bit, taking an extra step forward, trying to change the range of this fight a little bit as Colazzo is kind of resigned to working around the perimeter, and he gets caught with another good shot from Pacheco, who looks for a pull counter right hand again. And then he kind of like gives him a handshake, like, yeah, <laughs> good shot. <laughs> and they both dapped it up. I think that was a, a perfect observation by Corey. I think, oh, great right hand by Pacheco, over, overhand right. I think he's just inching in a little bit closer, getting in more in range so he can land that right hand. There it is again, that right hand. That one affected Colazzo. The feet might have been tangled as well, but that was a flush right hand from Diego Pacheco. They're both pretty big guys for this division, but I think Pacheco's power is just different. Well, he's certainly built unlike most super middleweights. We keep referencing the dimensions of Diego Pacheco, but he's not just a, a tall, lanky super middleweight. He certainly has power in that frame as well, and he's only growing into it as well. 
I met this kid, he was 19 years old. Eddie Hearn brought him straight to me and said, hey, I just signed this kid, uh, put him on your show. All I saw was big teeth, smiling. <laughs> That's all I saw. I didn't know he was a killer like this in the ring. And he just landed another great right hand, uh, Pacheco, that is. One of Benavidez Sr.'s goals, he said, was to turn Pacheco into a more exciting fighter. This isn't necessarily the type of matchup to put that on display, but you are seeing Pacheco pick up the tempo here and take a few more chances in round four. Yeah, you know, Styles make fights, you know. I, I think Calazzo's was making it a little bit difficult for him, you know, trying to pour that jab, trying to keep his distance as well. Ooh. Ooh, nice counter there from Pacheco. Colazzo did take that well. We enter the final 10 seconds of round four. Colazzo still not able to get anything going, but the right hand from Pacheco continues to be the story. Oh. The right hand of Pacheco all night long, so let's take a look at it again. I mean, oh, Pacheco showing he can counter, he can lead with the right hand and land like that, beautifully over the top. Wow, there it is again. And you see the grimace on the face of Colazzo, and he even looks in his corner and shakes, yeah, he got me. And we begin round five. Diego Pacheco in round four. It felt like he was turning up the heat a little bit on Enrique Colazzo. Some of those right hands starting to visibly have an effect on Colazzo after the fact. And Pacheco again just inching a little bit closer to start off round five. I just see that he's just a. <laughs> He's just a well-rounded boxer, Pacheco. You know, the way he's inching forward, but he's still concerned about defense. He's in and out of range with, with the movement of his waist. Good left hook by Pacheco. And he's not just throwing caution to the wind and just going in. And sometimes maybe Benavidez does that because his hands are so fast. He can get in there and throw an eight-punch combination and not worry about what's coming back. See Pacheco closing distance. You saw him just kind of touch with that right hand. As you pointed out, getting the left hook involved now for the first time. You'll see it every once in a while. One thing that Pacheco's corner really likes from him and really is hammering home is jab to the back shoulder. He's trying to throw the jab just almost past the head of Colazzo so he can't slip it. It also occupies his right hand, and he can come behind with the right hand. Yes, a good fighter, you know, he knows where, he studies his opponent, and he knows where the opponent is going to move his head, and he throws in that direction. But a few seconds ago, while we were talking, Diego landed a nice counter right uppercut. Pacheco slips out of the way of a right hand, slips out of the way of a jab. Good head movement here from Pacheco. Again, not a lot coming at him from Colazzo. Colazzo not taking too many chances, but down he goes. Perhaps a little too hesitant. And Pacheco fills the gap with an overhand right. Colazzo talking to Pacheco. Now's not the time for trash talk. Pacheco's got 45 seconds in the bag to finish this one in round five. Pacheco just measuring Colazzo right now, and that is it. Celestino Ruiz steps in, and Diego Pacheco, biggest step up, biggest victory of his young career. Wow. Well, that was an impressive, poised performance.
from Pacheco from start to finish. This kid is special. Pacheco is special. I just saw, I just saw like a 30-year-old fighter there tonight, not a 21-year-old. At the end of that fight, Calazzo looked at the ref and said, I'm okay, and then his eyes rolled in the back of his head. He was hurt. That was a good stoppage by the ref. Uh, we said during Pacheco's entrance, he's grown up before our eyes on the zone. Yeah. I think he really grew up with that performance. That looked like a maturing, if not mature, fighter. Right? I'm a believer. He, he proved something to me tonight. I mean, this was a veteran. This guy, Colazzo, yeah, he didn't fight on the top base, but he's a veteran of the sport. Even at great amateur pedigree as all, as well. So this guy, Pacheco, has proved that he's great. Ooh, look at that. He led with the right hand. Even though he stood up for a while, he was, he was already going down. So those body shots didn't mean anything. And the credit to Pacheco immediately reacted. He's going right down to the body. And a stoppage there from Celestino Ruiz. Not taking any chances with a wobbly fighter in Colazzo. I'm sure the Colazzo will debate the stoppage, but no debating the impressive nature of this performance from Diego Pacheco. And that partnership with the Benavidez camp, it looks like a perfect marriage right now. All right, we are ready to make this one official as Pacheco and Palazzo will chat it out, send it down to David Diamante. Ladies and gentlemen, referee Celestino Ruiz calls a halt to this contest. The official time of the stoppage, two minutes and 29 seconds of round number five. Your winner by TKO, he's still undefeated. And the new WBC USNBC Silver Super Middleweight Champion, Diego Pacheco. So Diego Pacheco improves to 16-0, the 13th knockout of his young career, and undoubtedly the most impressive one of his young career. Well, it is nearly time. The main card is just around the corner. We'll be back shortly to wrap things up here on the Live Prelims. Sam Kerr is joining Chelsea on a two-and-a-half-year deal. It'd be almost like Messi signing for the men's team. It's that big a deal, I think. It's quite annoying that everyone's so focused on Sam. I think people just need to take a step back and actually focus on the girls that are here. In the men's game, you have to play well to belong, and in the women's game, you have to belong to play well. To come in and to fight every day, it takes it out of you. And it's hard when you're just not quite good enough. The first year of being a mum and a manager was so tough. Last year, I felt I neglected the players emotionally. But this season is different. So are you quitting? Are we giving up? Can we push? We have to look for something in ourselves. If you've got new players coming in, you either see it as a threat and you kind of crumble with it, or you see it as a challenge and you thrive from it. The very best action from around the globe. From free running to Formula One and everything in between. This is the place to see exceptional athletes doing extraordinary things. Whether it's near impossible challenges or life-changing journeys of discovery, these are the innovators pushing the limits of possibility. Incredible moments, unforgettable stories. Welcome to the new home of Action Sports. Welcome back to the T-Mobile Arena. That completes our live prelim card. Uh, not long left now until the main card begins. 
You can see the QR flow there. Make sure you scan them. The action will be live on the zone. They do fantastic performance there from Diego Pacheco. Young man now taking his record to 16 and 0, 12 knockouts. He's got a lovely blue shiny belt as well. He's ringside now with Justin. We are here with the newest WBC, US NBC super middleweight champ, Diego Pacheco. When did you feel like that right hand started to find a home? Uh, after I started throwing it to the body a little bit, I could tell he started bringing his hand down a little bit, so I knew I could come over. And Eddie Hearn called it as well, and he, I, I, I could tell that other people were seeing it as well, not just me. So I, I threw it, and it went it was money. Earlier in the week, your camp said, You'll know a lot on how to adjust after that first round. What was your corner telling you after round one? Uh, you know, after the first round, you know, we're just uh, testing him, see what he had, see what he, what, what, how he reacted to certain punches. And uh, after the first round, uh, we, we, we kind of thought we were in a tough fight. But um, as, as the rounds kept going, after I think it was the fourth round, that's what my coach said. You know, I, I, I can see the opening now. It started throwing the right hand a little bit more up and down. And, and when I threw it on top, it landed perfect. What was he doing over the first three rounds that made it difficult to find a range? I could kind of tell, um, you know, when I when I throw certain punches, he was ready to counter. So, you know, so I had to, I had to kind of fake him a little bit, bait him in, and, and but he was a kind of a tricky fighter. I'm not gonna lie. He, um, you know, in sparring, you can tell when guys are kind of sharp, and the, and the guy, you know, was kind of sharp in the first round. So I had to be a little careful. Diego, you have grown up as a young professional among our eyes here on DAZN. Now you get your first pro title. Can you describe? what that feeling is like when you were awarded a green belt now. Uh, it's an amazing feeling, man. You know, I got to thank uh, Matthew and Dizon, um, for everyone involved for uh, giving me this opportunity, you know, to show the world the boxer in person that I am. You know, I couldn't be more grateful for that. And, um, you know, it just motivates me to keep working. This is the first of many belts, and I'm ready for the next one. Let's get it. Congratulations, Diego. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. No more hardware coming in to uh, Camp Benavides as we bring Matchroom Chairman Eddie Hernan Diego, thank you so much. What do you think here of your prize young prospect? Perfect. I mean, you know, it was a cagey affair. I said that the opponent was just sometimes trying to survive and he was talking to Diego and just trying to old man him a little bit and sort of get through the fight. And I said, be more aggressive. And the straight right hand just, he, he seemed to be just being out of range with it. And his left hand was lower and I just said to Diego, and Diego's always got his problem of looking out the ring during fights and like listening to people. And I said, throw the wide right hand. He looked at me and he went, what like this like actually in the fight i went yeah like that perfect backed him up and threw it and it was perfect you know 16 and 0 now still only 21 you know i remember obviously he was only 18 when we started working with him so you know 17 so you know it's it's good to see him now growing into his man's he's got an amazing training team as well i really feel like this is the future of the, the super middleweight division probably even after that the light heavyweight division and so on maybe cruiserweights who knows but it's very very exciting times he's really improving you know, he's, he's very diligent in his, his training, his preparation. He lives the life. And, you know, he really is a future star. What can we expect from Diego Pacheco over the next calendar year? Keep defending that. Keep fighting championship fights. One more this year. And then, you know, look to have four good championship fights next year as you go through the rankings. And, you know, you don't want to get there too quickly, but also you want to make sure you keep moving through the levels because he breezed through that level tonight. But at the same time, it's about taking your time and realizing he's 21 but not holding him back too much. You know, the sparring that he's getting with Benavidez and those kind of guys, top class, and he's got huge support now. You heard it the way in yesterday. We'd love to take him back. You know, maybe on the Estrada Chocolatito card would be another great fight card for him, and uh, things are going perfectly. A great way to cap beyond uh, before the bell here. Main event coming up, main card coming up. Overall, your final thoughts before the main event tonight. Well, I mean, first you've got Amo Williams against Kieran Conway, brilliant fight. Akhmadov against Rosado, brilliant fight. Jesse Rodriguez against Gonzalez, brilliant fight. And then you've got Canelo against Triple G. I mean, what more can you want? The main event's going to be an absolute war. I think it's going to be a very close fight. I don't think it will go 12 rounds, even though neither man has ever touched the canvas. Eddie, thanks so much. Appreciate your time here. Here on Before the Bell, let's go back upstairs. Fantastic performance from young Diego Pacheco, only 21 years of age, already 16 fights, 12 knockouts. Like, you must look at someone like him, and unless it goes drastically wrong, he's going to be in world title fight. Like Eddie said, the future of the super middleweight division, and at that size, I mean, at, at super middleweight, who can come, who can get, I mean, if he uses his size as he did early in his fight right away, I mean, and, and he likes to mix it up. He's a big puncher. Kind of remind me, it, it, you know, I don't, I don't want to mention the name, 
Tommy Hearns, but I, I just like his style. He has a similar style to Tommy Hearns. Very long, lengthy, big puncher, knows how to use his right hand. I love it. Yeah, there's, there's a lot still to learn, but what I like is that we're already seeing sort of him think about his work as well. He's got the distance, he's got the the, the reach, and he's starting to use that. He yeah, can exactly. fight up close when he needs to, but I like the way, look at that, bang. Yeah. Step the way, then in. And you know what I noticed about him, Addy? I remember when he first fought, I mean, when I first seen him a couple, few years ago, early in his career, he wasn't really growing into that man body. Right now, you see him cut, ripped up, cut, he's gaining muscle. He was like a kid when he first started fighting. He started take, he's spending a lot of time in the gym. He spent a lot of time in the gym as well. I only wonder how long he can stay at 168 pounds. All right, the main event today is going to be a fantastic one, and it's Canelo versus Triple G. Undisputed belt at 168 pounds on the line. Some people are saying even a pound for pound number one discussion could be on the line as well. Let's find out a bit more about Canelo. This is Canelo Unwrapped. Regularmente se dice que el boxeo es el deporte de los pobres, de los humildes. Y pues es cierto. La mayoría de los campeones que hemos tenido son gente de clase media hacia abajo. Gente que buscó una oportunidad en el boxeo y se le dieron las cosas. Toda la gente se fija ya cuando tienen los cinturones, cuando tienen los carros, cuando tienen las casas, eh, cuando tienen mil cosas que no tenían cuando iban empezando. Pero son años de trabajo, años de sacrificio. Para todos los mexicanos, creo que hablar de boxeo esa es, es llenarse uno de, de orgullo. ¿Por qué? Porque hemos tenido muchos atletas muy buenos. Estamos hablando de más de 150 campeones que ha producido el boxeo mexicano. Julio César Chávez. Juan Manuel Márquez, Marco Antonio Barrera, muchos deportistas que han dado su vida al boxeo y que han ido a todo el mundo y les han levantado la mano, han dejado una huella importante para nuestro boxeo, para nuestro deporte y más que nada para México y creo que todo eso es parte de, de que un deportista lo ame en nuestro país. que poco a poco tanto los aficionados mexicanos como los aficionados al boxeo se han dado cuenta que Canelo es uno de los grandes deportistas que hay hoy en día. El boxeador mexicano, por cultura se puede decir, es un boxeador que siempre le golpean bien al cuerpo, que tienen buenas combinaciones, que son buenos para tirar sus ganchos. Como mexicano, que es Saúl, pues se le facilita porque es la escuela netamente mexicana, una escuela de ganchos. Yo creo que Saúl es uno de los peleadores más completos que hay en el mundo porque sabe trabajar las piernas, sabe trabajar su defensa, sabe pintar, sabe tirar un buen jab, tiene muy buenas combinaciones. Más que nada es un peleador inteligente arriba del ring. El primer día que lo conocí, le preguntaron que como quién quería ser. Y como en ese entonces el campeón mundial era el Chololo, y dice, pues quiero ser como el Chololo. Y el Chololo le dijo, no, tú vas a ser más bueno que yo. Pues al final sí se cumplió la profecía y mira, llegó más que el Chololo. Cuando empiezan a gritar los aficionados, Canelo, México, pues obviamente te motivas y, y te emocionas más, ¿no? No, muy bonito eh, llegar a la arena y ver que afuera del estadio están los mariachis, está contenta la gente y ver como un carnaval mexicano, eso nos llena mucho de orgullo, ¿por qué? Porque venimos de México, venimos a Estados Unidos y es donde realmente se siente el apoyo de la afición y, y se ve que se está viviendo, como dicen, el sueño americano. Venir a Estados Unidos a triunfar y venir a hacer una fiesta en otro país creo que es lo más grande que hay. The Mexican fans. Oh. 
probably the most passionate and knowledgeable boxing fans out there. They get to the venue early to watch the earlier fight. Very passionate about their own, love to sing, love to dance, love music. In his fight against Abby Yildrim, we had Jay Balvin perform, who's you know, a huge star. And the ring walk was seven minutes, right? With fireworks spectacular going off and with 40 dancers on the stage. And you can just see Yildrim watching, going, oh no. Los aficionados, pues obviamente son importantes para mí, ¿no? Y quiero que se lleven un buen sabor de boca a cada evento que van, a cada pelea, y obviamente que estén orgullosos de lo que estoy haciendo, de siempre poner a los latinos, a México en alto, y eso es muchísimo para mí. La gente, el apoyo que me da es la motivación para seguir mejorando, esto es por ustedes. Saúl es un peleador ganador. Él se ha ganado el respeto de público, de los colegas. Él quiere ser un ejemplo para todos los mexicanos. Las peleas son una motivación para mí. Siempre me preparo al 100% para ganar. Y más que nada, quiero seguir haciendo historia en el boxeo y ser uno de los mejores peleadores de la historia. That's the documentary that Canelo wants that tells the story of Canelo and kind of explains about the superstardom and why we're here now as well. But let's not forget last time out against Brandon Gilbert. He did suffer a defeat. He was a heavy favourite going into the fight. Yes, I know he's got up to 175 pounds. Did we did we see a very good Dimitri Bivol or did we start to see a bit of slippage? From Canelo. I think it's a little, bit, a little bit of both. I wouldn't say slippage. I would say that we didn't see Canelo's best outing in that performance. A few things that he normally does, I didn't see him doing in that fight. Head movement, a lot of slipping and counter punching. Most, a lot of the time, most throughout that fight, when the ball would let his hands go, Canelo would just stay in the pocket and not move his head the way he normally does. But I don't want to take credit away from Bavol. It was a phenomenal performance. And Canelo will tell you, no excuses. The better man won. Let's not forget, he's fighting in a weight class that, in my opinion, he doesn't belong in. Yeah, look, maybe he doesn't. Sure. Um, you think we're going to see that fight? Yes. It, it's a fight that I think the fans will yes. see. You spoke to Canelo. It's a fight I think he wants to happen again. If he does get past Gennady Golovkin, does he fight Bibble, do you think? Or do you think Bibble maybe goes to Paterbia fight if he gets past her? Well, well I, look, one thing about Bibble, he understands the magnitude of a fight with Canelo. I'm talking about payday. I'm talking about size. Big profile fight. But part of him wants to be undisputed. That's important to him as well. And I don't know if Canelo... Canelo, I mean, first of all, he has to get past Ramirez. Let's not, let's not think hey, that Zerto is a, is a walk in the park. All right, Bavo has to get past him. Should he get past him, then Canelo is still going to be interested in that rematch. But Canelo's on record saying recently that if he does not beat Ramirez, he does not want the rematch with Bavo. If you're a Gennady Golovkin and you're watching that performance, and obviously he watched the fight. When I spoke to him yesterday, he said he only watched highlights. I'm sure he's watched that fight about 10 times. <laughs> can he take things away from that that he can implement tonight? Put yeah. Triple G on yeah. Canelo? Yeah. No, I mean, of course, you can always see things. Maybe you see some mistakes, but he's already shared the ring. He's already fought with him 24 rounds. There's nothing that Canelo can do that he hasn't seen already. So I'm not sure if he's going to the bowl, you know, uh, take the, the take tip from the bowl. He's going to go in there being typical Triple G. Because he feels already that that was enough the first two times. He's not going to change anything. How important was it that Bivol got the result? And I say that because everyone says it's difficult, or almost impossible, to beat Canelo on the scorecards here in Vegas. Clearly isn't. We saw it. Oh, that's key. That, that, yeah. I mean, look, as, as far as decision, I, I think that judges are becoming more fair because they're scrutinized now. They have a microscope under them because they're going to be waiting to see how they score Canelo fights. So I don't see that being a problem tonight. I think I do feel that we're going to going to get a fair decision as far as the judges scoring the fight. Uh, look, Triple G, we spoke about him all evening. You want to know a bit more about him, the man that is the unified middleweight champion. Make sure you watch this documentary, Making of Triple G.
Ощущение было те, что мы идем на большой бой. Оно, оно на высоком уровне, однозначно от, отличает от моих других соперников. И мы показали высокий бокс, и я сделал, считаю, все для своей победы. Я уверен, что в этом поединке было сделано достаточно для победы. I thought he got robbed. It had people thinking corruption, right? You love that in boxing. You hear that word a lot. То есть я был просто недоразумение, когда то есть один из судей, то есть столь неадекватно присудило. Ten rounds to two for Canelo. It just was preposterous. Most people feel that Gennady won that fight. I thought Golovkin won the fight. Um, now, watching it live, I had it seven rounds to five for Gennady Golovkin. I thought he got rubbed. You know, he definitely won the fight. Canelo had great moments in the fight, but on a 12-round fight scoring it on a 10-point must system, he lost at least seven. I think Oscar and uh, Canelo's corner were very happy that, that they got a draw. The draw I can live with, but to score the fight that one-sided for Canelo, it was unfair to both fighters because that's what fans are going to remember. They're going to forget how good the fight was, and they're going to focus on the negative. They're going to focus on the controversy. They're going to focus on their own outrage. I think the fight didn't go well for me, 100%, nor for my opponent. I'm confident that in this fight, it was made enough for the victory. And I'm not alone in this fight. You know, when you think of Gennady Glovkin's career, I think Gennady Glovkin's career is But the resume is that you even gave me a little, little saying, look there. That's the resume a lot. is quite thin because he doesn't have that, that highlight real win. Danny Jenkins is a big good win. You know, Derry Benzenko is a big win. Matthew Macklin, Lamu, but there. Daniel Jacobs. Yeah. But he needs that A level win. Yeah. I think he should have got it in the first part. I know you don't. Yeah. No, uh, look, as far as the scores, and people talk about it all the time, it's spilled milk, right? It's water under the bridge. We can water talk under, about it. Listen. It's water under the bridge for you, but when you speak to Gennady Golovkin, it certainly isn't water under the bridge. I get it, but talking about it is not going to do anything tonight to help him tonight. You know, it's, tonight he has to fight. Tonight he has to win. And I, and I know that he's been lingering around because he wants this fight. You know, he want, even though it's at 168, it's not at middleweight. Yeah. It, which, because you talked about one of the best middleweights in the world. All right, he's now he's a super middleweight, and now he's fighting. People keep forgetting he's fighting for all Canelo's belts, undisputed, all, all undisputed as super middleweight. And l listen, I, I, I think he looked great against Morata. I think we're going to see the best Triple G tonight, honestly. Yeah, look, we probably need to see the best Triple G, right? Last time out against Ryota Morata in Japan, I think we still saw a very good Triple G, but we have to be very honest early on. Hurt to the body a lot. Look, you can hear see the body shots there. And Maratti's a very big, by the way, 160 pounder. Yes, and, and he looked like he struggled a bit early on. He, he's fighting a younger guy. We, we talk about it all the time. This is a young man's sport. Young man's sport. Triple G broke him down the way he normally does. I like it. Yeah, look, it was good work by Maratta. I guess the key here is that Triple G showed that he's got the other, you know, the next gears, those levels. He went up the levels, went up the gears and got the stoppage. And I guess that, er that earned him the Canelo fight, the trilogy. Yeah, and that's why he's here. Look, absolutely fantastic fight card here, isn't it? It really is a fantastic fight card this evening. Only four minutes until the main card gets underway. Make sure you scan the QR code that you see on the screen right now. Let's have a look at the fight card. An exciting fight card that we have for you guys this evening. We kick things off from Austin Williams versus Kieran Conway. WBA International Middleweight title at stake there. Aliak Madoff versus Gabe Rosado. I'm telling you now, 
That could be a free round war. It really could. Jesse Bam Rodriguez, my fighter of the year versus Israel Gonzalez. That's for the WBC World Super Flyweight title. And then the big one, the trilogy that we have been waiting for for four years. We finally get to see it tonight. Saul Canelo Alvarez versus Gennady Golovkin. And as Ak said, for all the marbles at 168 pounds. Just before we go, Ak, quick prediction. Quickly, what do you think? I'm going to give you the prediction that I've been given all week. I think it's going to be a very competitive fight. I think even the rounds will be competitive. But at the end of the day, Canelo Alvarez wins this fight unanimously. There you go, guys. That's the prelims over and done with. The main card is about to get underway. Make sure you scan the QR code. You don't want to miss it. From myself, Adil Adipo, from the big man act. Don't miss this one. The trilogy is on its way. It's time to see the trilogy. Let people know who wants. 